want, I was going to uh, start here with the discussion of uh, network environments. Um, we may end, end up a little bit early uh, today because of uh, uh, some constraints I have at the, uh, at the end of the class. We might finish up a couple minutes early. Uh, we'll see how far we can get. Uh, there are two major things I wanted to talk about today. Um, one of them is uh, network environments, um, the sorts of networks supported by any logic, um, and uh, some information on um, character of the structure and dynamics of those sort of networks. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about was um, dynamic populations. How do you have populations which vary in size, and how do you have connections or, or dynamic networks, so, uh, networks which vary in size? Um, as time allows, we're going to uh, have a little bit of additional look at some issues with uh, Java. And uh, next time, we'll be talking uh, more about uh, network or agent movement over space and, and how, do you, how do you characterize agents as being uh, situated in space. Today, we're going to be topologically situated, situated in networks. OK, um, so what I'd like you to do is to load up your recently created model, the model we've kind of been working along. Um, it, last time we, uh, you'll recall, had added some pieces to have uh, transmission of infection through messages. If any of you are having trouble with that model, I did provide in that um, set of example models uh, something called minimalist SIR network ABM, which you could open up instead if, if you um, would prefer to use kind of a uh, um, a clean model, as it were. Um, either either will be adequate for examining the sort of things we're going to be looking at today. Um, naturally, I think if you can use your own model, that that has some uh, advantages because you'll know it inside out, and uh, it might help you relate to the model better. Um, so you recall that we've talked about the environment, um, the environment within a project. Where does that live? Can anyone tell me? Where does the environment live? Main, right. And uh, basically it dictates the spatial and the uh, network context of agents. So we saw that last time, and particularly there's an advanced tab. And the upper pieces of it dictate spatial characteristics. And we're going to be looking at those next time. Um, and the, the lower pieces dictate um, the network type. And then something about, sort of in the middle, is something that links the two, which is um, how do we arrange the, uh, uh, the agents within the population uh, in space based on their network characteristics or vice versa? Um, how do, and, and that arrangement in space will reflect in a visual arrangement as well. Um, so uh, the lower two are what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, the lowest one strictly is about network characteristics. And in fact, there's a set of parameters below that but uh, we will be talking about network type, uh, excuse me, layout type. So when we're specifying networks in any logic, there's um, two pieces, key pieces of information that we have to characterize. And indeed, that was the, the component shown in blue here. Number one is the network topology. So what's the structure of the network at a, on a logical level? Um, putting aside the issue of kind of uh, spatial mapping. And the second thing is spatial and visual layouts. Okay, so it's how is it going to appear? And, and how are the people within the network going to be arranged in space? Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to be looking at both of these within these lectures. Um, uh, generally speaking, we're going to have uh, uh, an interplay between nodes locations and nodes connections. Okay. Um, so spatial layouts are going to determine where the nodes appear in space and on the screen. And the network type is going to determine who is connected to who. Okay? So we're specifying both of these. Um, for the most part, these characteristics are determined independently. Okay? Um, but you'll see there's two types of networks, namely distance-based uh, networks. Uh, excuse me, three types. Uh, distance-based um, and um, a type of network that uh, where we have uh, clustered items being 
being shown together, excuse me, it is just two types, clustered items shown together, sort of arranged to be appear close to each other, to be located close to each other if they're connected, and then distance-based connections. Um, so for those two types, they're coupled together in important ways. Um, this is two-dimensional models. There are three-dimensional models that I'm not going to get into here. Okay, um, here we're dealing with 2D because it's a pretty good approximation to uh, to geographic space, mm -hmm. particularly. Um, but uh, 3D is also possible with any logic. So can you see if I can get what you're asking and, and, if, and if I don't you know help help me understand better so uh, if you're asking can you have agents that are situated far apart from each other in space right. but logically are still connected yeah yes absolutely and in fact we'll see lots of examples of that okay. today um, you can also have cases where those connections are contingent upon them being located close in space right, right? Um, so you can have either one Great question. Could it be, so for instance, if you're trying to model as an organization, yeah. could, could the network be based on, not on distance, but on, say, where in the organization the person is? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, for a lot of those sort of questions, what you're going to be wanting to think about is one of two things, either a, um, a, a network that's hierarchical, okay. where you have something like, um, know different uh, uh, different levels uh, perhaps here maybe these are different project teams for um, uh, you know engineers or something um, uh, excuse me. Um, and and you'll have uh, perhaps even a caveman network where everyone's connected to everyone at that level but you might have a manager and you know the manager would relate to all these but uh, would have connections with others at their level um, and, and you might have something along these lines, and then you know on it goes uh, upwards, for example. And you could do that. Um, some of that can be done through built-in network types with a hierarchical model. We'll see in another lecture how we build up hierarchical models. So in other words, where this might be, I've, I've commented on this before, this might be uh, project teams, and these are uh, different divisions in a company, and these are, you know, and the whole thing is in one company. Or these might be uh, individual animals uh, within a farm, and the farms are located within some state and within some country. Um, so those hierarchical models are um, readily built up within any logic, and then you just use built-in network types to connect them. The other possibility is you can build up networks in a custom fashion using some of the um, mechanisms we'll see in the second part of today's, uh, today's lecture. Okay? Um, in other words, you, you can have a bit of code which builds up a custom network structure per your interests, um, or reads a file in or di from a database and sets up a network accordingly. Okay? So um, generally speaking, it's faster if you can build atop existing built-in networks and uh, maybe do them in a hierarchical way, but if that's not possible for your application, you might you might have some custom code to build up the network. Okay, it's a great great question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so it's a network where everyone is connected with everyone else. It's a good question, and having studied paleontology, it's. Uh, <laughs> it's not immediately obvious to me. Um, uh, I believe that the analogy is probably that um, the belief was that um, that early hominids um, exhibited li limited uh, variability in their in their in their sort of connection repertoire, okay. and you would have a, a small clan or family living together, say in a cave, and they would all know each other, um, <laughs> and uh, 
and there was no sort of um, hierarchy that limited access to one or other of the members. Now, of course, what that belies is the fact that um, these uh, caves were presumably distributed in space and different foraging subgroups would encounter each other but wouldn't encounter someone who's a thousand miles off and so on. But um, that's the term for whatever reason that's used for a fully connected network, as we call it a completely connected network. And in, um, I think in mathematics it's called a case of N. So like a, a K3 would be a, a completely connected, you know, threesome, and a K4 would be a completely connected um, thing like that. That would be K4, this would be K3, and so on. Um, so that's a, a totally connected network. K probably being the equivalent of a hard C in German. Um, <laughs> um, so anyway. Um, caveman network, and we'll see several other types of networks um, here that any logic supports, okay? Um, so I've just been distinguishing here between two sets of issues that we're going to be dealing with today. One is, is network topology, the choice of who is connected with whom, purely a logical matter. The other is layout, which has to do with where people appear physically in space, in a 2D space, and by extension where they appear on the screen, okay, visually. Those being sort of map, direct mappings of one another, uh, where they are in space and where they appear on the screen. And we're gonna see that there's, um, uh, they are distinct attributes, but they're coupled. And particularly they're coupled for two types of networks, okay. So, um, Let's go, uh, I, I asked people if you could call up your, um, the, the network we've been built, or the model we've been building up, um, to which we added infection transmission or contagion of one sort or another last time. If you uh, are having difficulties with that model or if you prefer to sort of start from a clean model, you could alternatively open up the example model I provided for the class called Minimalist SIR Network ABM, okay? Um, slight differences between the two, but either will be fine for, for our uh, discussion today. Um, so I'd like you within that model to go to, and I'll try to do it uh, here on the screen, um, um, uh, go over to the um, environment. And uh, specifically, I'd like you to open up the advanced area of the environment, okay? And um, You'll see, again, those, those two general reasons I mentioned. The top one having to do with spatial layout, the very bottom most with network layout, and kind of in the demilitarized zone between them, the layout type, because it actually um, relates to sort of the connections between the two, okay? Um, you'll notice if you pull down the, the drop-down box down in, in network, you'll see a set of networks that are built into any logic. And, um, Perhaps because of paleontological good judgment, uh, caveman is not one of those. Um, uh, it is simple to define a caveman network using one of the other network types, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, okay? Um, but you'll see you have a, a choice, a palette, as it were, of different network types, where the first of them is user-defined, where basically that says we built up the network. Uh, don't define it for me, I'll define it, thank you very much. Um, and then we have a random, what's called Poisson random, ring lattice, um, small world, scale free, and then finally distance based down there at the end, okay? So uh, these are a set of built-in network types and they, they span a conceptual space um, as well as being very common types of networks from the literature, okay? Um, so, um, Again, somewhat orthogonal to that, not totally independent, but, but uh, fairly distinct from that is the layout type. So if you go out and you pick up the layout types just above it, you'll see there's a set of layout types. And there's four of them in addition to user-defined. User-defined, again, is sort of, I'll take care of that. It has some default placement, but you can override it. And then there's a random one, which is uniformly distributed, arranged, which in which nodes are placed in a very regular pattern on the screen. Ring, which displays the nodes, uh, situates the nodes so that they're displayed uh, as well as being situated within a ring structure. And spring mass, which attempts to 
minimize the distance, the spatial distance between people that are connected. Okay. So again, the layout is kind of the nexus of where are people located visually as well as in space. It's two being almost interchangeable up to a scaling factor. And so, so the nexus between that, the, where they're located spatially on the one hand, and between who's connected with who. Okay? So we're going to see how those two interplay, and it's not entirely a straightforward thing. So um, these are just comments on the, on the things I just talked about. Spring, spring mass is a little bit unusual in the sense that there's a fairly sophisticated algorithm that runs to figure out kind of how they are situated based on their existing connections. Okay, so the first thing we're going to be talking about is something we've already seen, which is distance-based networks. And the, the primary function of these is to capture geographic locality um, within the network structure. In other words, it, it kind of used the network as um, being derivative from or um, uh, being um, sort of secondary to the spatial locations, okay? So you connect people that are located within a certain distance of one another. Now, the logical implication of this is that networks may be discontinuous. If, if you have a small enough threshold, you, know, you require people to be really close to each other, um, and you may have some people who aren't connected with anyone else, for example or co components which are separately connected but not connected to one another. So let's go check that out. And that's probably the setting you have right now. So we're, we're looking at network. We sh let's choose a distance-based network. And we have a connection range. I have 50 down, and I'd suggest that. And, and let's go uh, run this just to, to remember um, what it looked like. And I'm doing this on the regular size population, not the big population. And uh, what we see is something like this. Um, so here we had uh, the infection in my particular you know, random number seed that was chosen. It started here and it only spread so far. And we have these disconnected components. We call them components, um, places where either directly or indirectly person A can get to person B within that component. But those components are separated almost in islands uh, unto themselves where infection can't currently jump from, say, this component to, uh, to that component. Um, in other words, they're, uh, they're disconnected uh, out, you know, between components, connected within components. And uh, you can only get percolation within a component. Um, so uh, this is a static network, of course, but it's, it's reflective of, of this general, uh, general principle. So uh, I'm just going to switch back here. Um, it's an example of a discon uh, discontinuous networks. Um, so uh, for distance-based, again, I want to stress that here, <coughs> spatial location is primary. Connectivity is derivative upon it. We will see the exact opposite when we come to the spring mass layout associated with laying out um, other types of networks. But for, for distance-based, you have that, that spatial location being primary. Okay. Um, the key threshold here is the connection range. So if we go from this connection range of 50 on the one hand, um, so I'm going to terminate that, go back here, and we're going to go from a connection range of 50 to a connection range of um, 100, what do you expect to see? If, if people are connected now um, under a looser criteria, you don't require them to be within 50 units of each other, but 100 units, more generous in connecting people, what do you expect to see? More, more connections, right. And, and by extension, fewer components, right? Um, so uh, fewer disconnected components, more giant components that, that encompass 90% or more. And so indeed, you, you now have a situation where the infection can propagate uh, more or less through the entire network. Um, and uh, that yields a different sort of qualitative situation as far as influence of one individual upon the whole. So the connection range is, is key here. Yeah? 
Okay, so um, for those who uh, are either using the built-in version, um, the one that, that I provided, I said you could load, um, or who, who hadn't um, still had that with your model, I'll review that so you could see where it's done. Um, and it's a good review. So within, so, so how would I set, let's, let's reason this thing through. Where would, where would the size of that oval associated with a person be set? It's in person, it's not in Maine. Maine is just the stage, so it's in person. And, and where is it in person? Okay, yeah, so it's among their attributes. So let's double click, we'll get to person. Okay, yeah, and, and specifically, the reason that appears on the screen is because we have a sort of a graphical object defined associated with this person. And it's up here in the upper left. Um, we added it the first day, I think. And, and indeed, it's in the dynamic properties for it. Exactly right. And specifically, if you go to the radius x, radius y for the person, you can see that, that um, that's specified here as, as uh, the income is specified as defining the radius. Okay? So I have income divided by 2,000. Um, that is why it... Um, it, it shows those different sizes because there's heterogeneity in income, okay? Because, and why is there heterogeneity in income? Where is that defined? Who remembers where that was defined? That was a parameter, and that parameter and the distribution associated with it was specified where? In, that's right, in the population which lives in Maine. And that's right. So if we go up to Maine, you go to the population here, um, you'll see that income was defined as being drawn from this distribution, okay? Um, that's defined in the population rather than in person per se because it might differ for different populations. And by parameter, we allow the, the, the folks responsible for creating this population to dictate its characteristics. The parameter gives that conduit of communication between, on the one hand, the context in which it's created, and on the other hand, the object itself, the, the agent itself, okay? So, so that was kind of a recap for why they're different sizes. Now, incidentally, if we had gotten rid of that income divided by 2,000 left at blank, they would have been just the default size um, for, for person. So there, they would have appeared all uniform size, this, this size, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so great question in a review. Okay, so... Um, Let's go now to, um, to take a look at, um, okay, we, so we saw this. Now let's take a look at a different network type, okay? Um, we're going to take a look at a network type where, again, we have locality. In fact, we have arguably even more locality. But the locality here is not, not spatially based. Um, it's based on sort of logical locality of different, of different agents, okay? So we're going to look at what's called a ring lattice network. And this is a network which exhibits purely local connectivity, and agents are in a sort of one-dimensional structure. Not a 2D, as is used for a distance-based layout, but a one-dimensional structure, a long chain where the one exception is the people on the two ends of the chain are connected to one another. So it's a big ring. Okay? Um, the one ring that binds them. And um, we're going to uh, see how that affects uh, the dynamics. So let's go back to our model here. And um, we need to go again to the environment to, to change the network type. And we need to change it from distance-based uh, to a ring lattice, which is the uh, third, one, third one in the list there. Okay? Um, now, um, you'll notice that when we do that, just below it, the parameter area changes, okay? So uh, I don't know if, if you saw that, but let me emphasize again. I'm going back to distance-based, and you'll notice this connection range is enabled. We can fill that in. If we go up to ring lattice, only connections per agent. So it's, it's basically enabling and disabling ones um, as to whether they're germane for the, for the particular network type. Here, the salient parameter, the only parameter on there which makes sense is how many connections do you have per agent? In other words, each agent is assumed to be connected 
with a certain number of connections on either side of it. And how many do you have? We're going to start with two, and we can futz with it and see um, see the effect of more connections. So the are not useful. Right. So they just stay on four. So they are there if you want to switch to other so other networks. They won't be wiped out. So it's just for convenience. It's for convenience, and so that. It um, like it's assumed a hundred or something. It just doesn't make us change. The correct. Network. That hundred has no operational meaning right now, and. Um, what it does mean is if you were to go and switch over to one where it has an operational meaning, like distance-based, and change it, and then switch network types, it will still remember it. It doesn't toss it out, but it, um, it, it grays it out to show it's not operational. Okay? Um, and I think it's, generally speaking, it's to kind of afford you a, a way of quickly changing network assumptions and s seeing the effects without forgetting your parameters. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're doing ring lattice here. And I'm going to do two connections per agent. And let's run this. Let's run this model, okay? So we're going to go and we're going to run it. And um, what we're going to see is that, well, we, we see something that's not terribly instructive. Um, and I did this by design. Um, what is notable about this in terms of how it differs from the last one? There, there are some differences from the last one. Can you, can you enumerate a couple? Of, let me count the way. Let you count the ways. That this differs. Okay, everyone has two connections. That's key, and that's arguably the most important property. What else is, is different about the nature, the spatial nature of those connections? They're very long range. They're very long range. In fact, there there's no <coughs> particular preference for short or long range connections. They're they're kind of haphazard in their length, right? There's there's some short range. There's a lot of long range ones. Whereas previously we had distance based, which was by definition, all shorter range connections, right? Okay, so so this is a ring lattice, um, but you'd have to take it as yeah. Can we also infer that the, all the um, agents are connected now because in the previous network they saw some isolated agents oh. that were not connected, and in this ah. network they uh, must. Be this connected. is correct. They are all connected by by its nature. Mm -hmm. They are all connected to one another. However. The, the, the visualization there was singularly uninstructive for helping you understand that connectivity, to help you to, to prove that these are all connected and indeed that the infection could propagate to them would, would require a lot of sort of eye squinting, to say the least, right? Um, now, I was musing about the idea of having you time this, um, time sort of the infection spread here. I'm actually running this out, and take it. Take my assurance right now that these are all connected. We'll see a kind of visual proof of it in just a moment. But um, do you notice anything about the relative timing of this compared to that distance-based network in terms of how long it's taking for more or less the entire network to get infected? Taking longer or quicker? Taking longer. It actually takes a lot longer, and we'll see why in just a sec. Okay, so, so it seems to you know, um, visually have a few differences, but um, to, to really bring those out more strongly, we have to appeal to this, to this layout property. So we're going to go up to environment again. That's where we dictate not just the network type, which we just changed, but this layout type. So specifically, I want you to draw down from user defined, which is here really just meaning the default one, since we're not overriding it in any way, and pull it down to ring, okay? Um, so um, we're going to uh, call this up and run it here. Ah, the ring of truth, forsooth. Um, so, so now we have um, a depiction of the same logical network, but depicted so that the spatial layout and the visual layout, again by extension, um, helps you understand the connectivity, right? And what you see is that the infection is spreading. But it's, in spread, it's spreading, and spreading very slowly. Why is it spreading slowly? Why do I say that at a qualitative level? You can only spread to your direct mate. Yeah. There's no shortcuts, right? There's no shortcuts by which you can jump kind of across the pond, so to speak. If you're going to spread, you can only really spread along one dimension. Mm -hmm. Now, that's in contrast to the two-dimensional uh, distance-based network, where you can spread in two dimensions, right? So things could spread more quickly. Here you have to kind of thread through this, this long 
circuitous route. Well, it's not terribly circuitous, but it's long. Um, and you know, finally, it's going to get over there, but it takes uh, quite quite some time. So this is a visual depiction that helps us understand that structure of the network. Mind you, however, that we've done something with a certain measure of import if your model cares about space. Because here, people are arranged not just visually, but in space according to this ring structure. Okay? So, so that is dictating their spatial location. So if we were to ask about their spatial location, it's dictated by this ring. Now here, our model doesn't care about spatial location per se, so it's not really uh, germane. But be aware that you know that that visual layout does come about because we are changing the spatial location. Okay. Um, okay. So there's no shortcut, um, and uh, this ring lattice network type is most naturally displayed with with the layout. Type. Um, I mean, logically, it works without laying it out that way. It's just it helps you really understand what's going on in terms of locality of spread if you show the, the, the layout type. So this is without the ring layout, and this, uh, this is with the ring layout. What is an example of using this uh, ring lattice? Um, I'm sorry? What is the example of an example of ring lattice? Well, uh, it's, it's an extremely common um, sort of stylized model where you have essentially very, very local connections. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're interested in understanding how network structure impacts the dynamics of the network. Mm -hmm. This is an extreme. This is like a, the most extreme network you could still have that's still connected, mm -hmm. but um, you have you know no global structure. And then what we're going to see is that there's a a flip network called a Poisson random network that's the opposite extreme. There we have basically um, no regard to whether things are global or, or, or local connections. In a way, everything is global. It, everything, you're just connected with random people. And, and so often we examine the dynamics for these two extremes mm -hmm. and we contrast them to understand how does the network structure impact those dynamics. So it's not so much that the ring lattice is an inherently good representation of how things are in the world. It's just it helps us understand how does the network structure more broadly affect things. Now, you know, that being said, there may be cases where you have, um, you know, a spread of Ebola in a subway tunnel or something <laughs> like that, where where you might you might arguably have, you know, sort of a more or less. Um, 1D um, spread of things, but uh, for most part, it's very stylized. Okay, okay. So now let's go to Poisson random. Um, now Poisson random networks go by many to many different names. Okay. Um, let me let me just close this off because this is being um, truculent, um, and I'm just going to close this previous model that we had built. Um, it's not really serving much uh, function. Okay. So we're going to go up to environment now. And we're going to now, uh, excuse me, environment. Um, and we're going to go change this from a um, from a ring lattice to a ran what's called a random network. And I'd like you to change the the layout type. Well, heck, let's let's keep it as ring. Let's see what happens. I mean, um, it'll probably endeavor to do something. Okay, so a random network is kind of the the polar opposite in a way. Of, uh, of a ring lattice network. Ring lattice only connects people who are logically next to each other. And of course, on a random network, any two pairs of nodes have the same chance of being connected. So it's just for every pairing, possible pairing of nodes, it's just going to be flipping a, a possibly you know weighted coin. Um, so biased coin, maybe it's 0.2, or maybe it's uh, you know 10% chance or 1% chance, and connecting them if it turns out heads, right, and, and not connecting them otherwise. So it has no preference at all for any sort of spatial or topological locality. There's no, there's no greater likelihood that um, you know uh, uh, that I'm connected to the friend of one of my friends. In other words, um, there's no more overlaps in the connections of two neighbors than among two arbitrary nodes in the population. Typically, our connections in the real world have a lot of locality. Okay, it's not a ring lattice type extreme locality. But you know, people, um, if I know someone, if I know two people, 
if I know A and B, chance is pretty good that A, chance is better than average for two people in the world that A knows B too, right? Um, because those two people might be drawn from an office or they might be drawn from my field of study or they might be drawn from my family or whatever. And there's a pretty good chance, they higher than average chance they know each other, okay? So there's actually a lot of locality in the networks you see in the world. Physical locality reflecting where we live, um, logical locality reflecting the different network contexts, family, office, um, you know, social groups, etc. And uh, so you get a lot of sort of so-called triangles, cases where, you know, again, I know A, I know B, and B, uh, A and B know each other as well. Okay? Um, that is not observed at all within a, a Poisson random network. It's um, just has equal chance. Now, Poisson random, I should note, goes by many different names. It's called random network. It's also called a Bernoulli network. And um, uh, Erdos random network is another name for it uh, after a famous mathematician, I think the first one to examine this. So if we have random, random chosen as the network type, now we have a specification of a mean number of connections uh, per agent there. Um, excuse me. Oh, sorry, if you change it to Um, you're, you're saying with the ring lattice you're saying yeah. okay so so um, you folks don't have to follow along but that's a great question from Sergey so I will so we're, we're flipping back for a moment to ring lattice to see how connectivity would differ so so I'm still going to display it with a ring ring layout but let, let's think about this a bit so what we had already was two so what that means is we're all lined up right in this long line and I'm connected with person on my left and person on my right that's what it means. Four would mean, if I did four, it would mean I'm connected with two people on my left and two people on my right, two adjacent people. Okay. So 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 let's do four. Um, incidentally, I don't remember what three does. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not quite sure uh, how it how it deals with that asymmetry and so on. But but you know, this is four, and you actually can't visually see much of a difference. But here, things can go faster because it can it can kind of hop over someone right and um, roughly speaking I expect it to kind of in fact the whole network can about twice uh, half the time you know twice as fast right because um, it can kind of jump twice as quickly right um, and and indeed you see it it's sort of converging there um, more quickly okay so um, so great question um, uh, I'll leave it as an exercise to examine the impact of, of odd numbers. Okay, so let's go back to, uh, to random. And this allows us to specify a certain number of average connections per agent. So how many, how many connections on average do you want some agents to have? That doesn't mean they all have that number. Some may have more, some may have less, okay? Um, some may have more, some may have fewer. Um, so that becomes an average here from the street the Yeah, yeah, so here it's an average. For ring lattice, it's actually an integral number, I think. So in other words, it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you know. Um, here, it's actually a mean. Uh, so, so let's, let's go, um, let's go run, run this with four, right? So if people on average have, have four connections. And I left it as a ring. This is a ring layout of a random network, right? Um, you can argue about the aesthetics of it, but it's actually one way of kind of trying to visualize a quite compl complicated connectivity pattern. Now, I'm going to start running that again. So I, here the infection is seeded. And compare the speed of that spread to the speed with ring lattice. It shoots up very quickly compared to ring lattice, very quickly. Because these are, this contains gobs of global connections. I mean, there's really no notion of locality. Again, there's no notion of kind of um, a little group of neighbors in any meaningful sense because, again, my, my friend and I have basically no relationship in terms of our other connections, you know, no, no sort of uh, regularities in terms of our other connections. So here it, it rises very quickly. We have, we have a lot of connections, in other words, which span this space, right? Um, Is that a knowledge on Facebook? 
Sorry? Is it the spread of Norwegian Facebook? Uh, I would argue that Facebook probably has a lot of locality associated with it. But there are some long distance connections. And in just a minute, we'll see how we can merge the two, okay? But, but let me just visually contrast these two again. So uh, visually, I'm going to be going back and uh, running these with, uh, with a ring on us. And you'll notice what, what's clear here is that the middle is a big gaping hole, right? There's nothing in the middle of that bagel or donut. Um, there ain't nothing there. Um, there's no space. You can't like move through it. You can't have a network. You have to go along. You have to go along that that sort of edge here to communicate the infection. Right. So the distance space in the ring lines. Yeah. So if you went 50, it would have to be 50 units around the ring as opposed to 50 units. Yeah. Through the ring. That's exactly that's exactly right. Compared to distance space where you can spread in 2D in yeah. different directions. So so there that was for ring lattice for. Um, for the uh, random network, Poisson Random, we have that whole middle area. We have some connections around the periphery, don't get me wrong. There's some, some connections that, you know, to someone who happens to be laid out next to you. But there's really no principled reason why some person has to be laid out next to another. I mean, there's really, it's just, I believe what is going on behind the scenes is that just putting arbitrary people next to each other. Because there's no rhyme or reason why it would get two other people. Um, you could try to look for patterns, but they'd be artificial. It'd be you know, just statistical aberration. So really, these are sort of have arbitrary ordering <coughs> along the periphery, and there's some there's some connections along there. Not not here, not here, for example. But, but here you can see some connections. But there's a ton that go across, and those things that go across make the world of difference when it comes to rapid propagation of the infection, because those are the shortcuts it takes. Those are the ways in which it hops from, oh, look at that. Just when, just when I need it. Okay, what happened there? It relates to what Chris was uh, saying um, a couple times ago. What happened there? I just ran it. Where's, where's the infection? <laughs> there was one person, the person who got the initial seed wasn't connected to anyone. Uh, so, so that's a possibility. In any case, there could, Th well, there, there was a red, but they recovered. Oh, okay. They just blinked. They just blinked. I saw them. I saw them blink. Um, uh, I didn't blink. They did. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, that blink uh, was was short-lived enough that probably because of some aspect of their connectivity. I mean, I guess they probably had some connections, but it wasn't enough, evidently in this particular case, given the rolls of the dice, to get anyone infected. So again, this is a, a warning about the stochastics here. You know, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of random fluctuations here. And sometimes those are more pronounced than others. This is a case, which I'd guess is very unlikely for this particular one, but it's possible, where you know, the network's dynamics, the average time to recover and so on, and the number of connective connections per node is such that some, a reasonable fraction of the time, you get no spread. Okay, now this person here, okay, now it jumped over, and you'll notice that spread very quickly globally, right across the, the pond from it's kind of slow into the beam, but then it starts accelerating. Then it starts accelerating, that's right. Um, so here, I want to distinguish that it is spreading globally, but there's no, People here do have variability in terms of their connections. What I'm going to do is um, I will go create, I'm going to go create another um, a little uh, experiment um, which is going to have, you know, tiny population or something like that. And um, I'm going to uh, set it up such that um, we have, um, okay, we're, we're all set for that. Parameters, remember, that's how I set the parameters. I'm going to set it up so that we have uh, a, a very modest number of connections. So let's say 10, okay? So remember what I just did there is I went and I right clicked on network, minimal network thing. I did, I did ex new experiment and uh, I went through that and just told it the default settings, just named it something different. And then within this, I went to parameters and set the parameter for it, the sole parameter. What, why does it only give one parameter? Where's that parameter coming from? Anyone remind me? 
Yeah, it's from main. That's a parameter in main. That's the parameters again are the con conduits of communication from where you create the thing to to that thing you're creating that tell it what to assume. We saw that with the population creating the agents, well, telling them what to assume as far as heterogeneity for income. Here, this is this is the thing that's responsible for creating Maine, and we can tell Maine what to assume for the population size. And we can do that by virtue of the fact, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, um, we, <laughs> we can do that uh, by the fact that um, we only have one parameter here, population size. And if we right? omit it here, we have the default uh, in Maine. That's, that's, if we omit it here, we have the default in Maine that would, uh, uh, okay, so, I think this is actually filled in textually with the default. So in other words, the default specifies the value. When you create a new simulation, what is it going to fill in here? OK? OK? Um, so I think actually you would need to, uh, I don't think it would actually run uh, without, I may be wrong. Maybe, maybe it does do the default. Oh, yep, yeah, it does the default. OK. So I, uh, I misspeak. Um, it actually does copy that as the default. Oh, look, it filled it in again. Uh -huh. So. So yeah, it, it apparently just uses the set of default to fill it in if, if you're not so generous to do it yourself. Okay, so I'm running this and I'm doing this in hopes that we'll get a kind of clearer view. Okay, so, so this, is, this lends a, a sort of a clear view to things. Now, do all these nodes have an equal number of connections? No, no, they certainly don't. Um, so for example, uh, this, this individual um, has five connections, right? Um, and uh, this individual four here has six connections. Uh, this individual up here also has six. This individual here seems to have eight, um, eight connections. So there's some variability in connections here. Right, and that's, that's what we, we actually, well, to be clear, I'm talking about if in the network properties we had set, um, so network properties, yeah. we set connections per agent to be four, that's the mean. It's trying, to, it's trying to get that for the mean and sort of rolling the, figuring out what the network density is. Okay, so four connections per agent, how many networks are there in the population, then what must the probability be that a given pair is connected. That's what's going on logically right now. Now, this is not going to be exactly the mean that it's going to get for, for the, um, if you look at the mean across the network, it's not going to get this exactly. It's going to be a little bit off, but that determines the probability two people are connected, okay? The distribution will be what? So the distribution is going to be, for a given person, you're going to have a, uh, a uh, Bernoulli distribution, actually for a given, uh, possible connection and so the whole thing is going to be binomially distributed uh, for a person. There's going to be some number of connections. Uh, I've got to think about that a little bit but definitely each connection is Bernoulli and for a given person you're going to have a set of possible connections to whom and so yes it's going to be binomially distributed with with a, a certain probability and, and they're going to have if you have a person n people in the populations you're considering a given person they're going to have n minus 1 possible connections. And for each of those, there's just some chance that it's going to be connected. Note that connection here is bidirectional. So if A is connected to B, B is connected to A. Okay. There are ways, so that, that is true in any logic. There are ways to mark a connection manually as to which way it goes and have it observe that semantics. But be aware that connections by their sort of by default are, are um, are bidirectional, are bidirectional in any logic. Sorry, yeah. I, think yeah. I think I must miss something simple, but sure. if the connection per agent or average is four just now, yeah. we'll receive a charge, yeah. each one has at least yeah. five, right? No, no, th uh, that's a good question. Okay, let's let's go check it out. Let's go check it out. Um, you may be right. I think you're right. The ones I noted at least had five. Um, so that should be the mean and shooting for. Um, uh, so, so here we have, well, okay, so here's a four, right? Um, and uh, here's a many more than four. Five, here's a, okay, that's the four. Um, yeah, you're right, it's, uh, it's actually. 
No, but like this one is not connected with there, right? Um, this one is not connected with this one and so on. Yeah, it does dictate the probability of connection on um, this thing, but you're right that it, it is biased in an interesting way here, and it'd be interesting to, to study that. I mean, there, there is one case in any logic where I know you specify that it actually turns out to be twice that. Um, for, because of the small number issues, uh, small sample size issues, and it's biased in one direction. That could be. It would be an interesting thing to kind of play around with it. Extra credit. Um, so, could you track that by, like, yeah. like, say you wanted to know that you yeah. create a variable yeah. that averages yeah. it like, trace line or something like yeah. that. Yeah. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see how to do that. In fact, um, I, I'm tempted to throw caution in the wind and just do it right now, but uh, we, may, we may do that later today, okay? Um, uh, insert, if we don't do it today, we'll do it next time, okay? Um, whereby we can do it. Um, so, uh, yep, we could very easily check what the, uh, the actual empirical, you know, mean is. Um, okay, so we've, we've just, seen, um, uh, just seen this, and as we increase the sample size, or the, yeah, the sample size, the population size, we'll probably have a closer convergence is my guess. I think that's true. Let's try con connections per agent one. Let's just see what, let's say 0.5, right? Um, sorry? Sorry? Uh, Let's, let's see if it, it first of all, if it coughs. Um, uh, yeah. So, so here we do have a lot with zero, some with one, and you know, uh, I'd say we have uh, what six yeah, of them with six one six and four eight. with zero. So it's not not exactly point five, um, point six, but. Well, oh, okay, it's, it's actually quite straightforward. So, so, um, uh, so if you think about it, if we have a network with N agents in it, right, um, there's, there's only a certain number of, of possible connections, right? Um, and it, you, you have to think about uh, the mathematics uh, a little bit carefully because connections are by nature bidirectional. Um, so A is connected to B, B is connected with A. Um, when we have uh, three, three possible agents, we only have three possible connections. And in general, I think if we have N agents, we're going to have N times N minus 1. So each person can only be connected to N minus 1 other possible people divided by 2. Does that... Uh, so this would be uh, three times two divided by two, which would be three possible connections uh, here, for example. And this is the number of candidate connection, sort of, because uh, A, to put it another way, A connected to B is the same as B connected to A. So, so we have that factor divided by two. So that's the number of candidate connections which you have to choose among, right? And for each of them, you have a certain fixed probability that it turns out to be true, right? Um, so uh, if, we have, if we have a mean connection per agent, call it C, okay? And we have N, N individuals in the population, um, then that yields sort of, we are seeking a mean of N times C connections for the whole, for the whole, um, network, right? And if we want that many connections out of this many possible connections, the probability of a possible... So all that's doing is, is basically figuring out for every pair of connections, logical pair, A, A to B, same as B to A, there's a certain probability that it's in fact realized, a certain probability that it's in fact true. So for for any given connection in that network, we have n, n times c divided by n times n minus 1. So these are the set of all possible connections, the number of possible logical connections. And, um, and uh, this is the number of ones we want, right? We want these. And so the probability that a given connection will, in fact, be 
be realized is, is P is one divided by the other. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. It's also the direction. It's bi directional, right. Um, so this may be okay. Yeah, so I'd have to think about that. It may be it may be two yeah, times this, that's right. Um you'd have to you'd have to think of that uh cancels out the way. But yeah, I think uh, just like that we're off by a factor of two potentially. So that that's how it figures it out. Quite straightforward. Um and it doesn't guarantee that you're gonna have exactly that many. It'll be on average you have two NC or two s or NC number of connections, but there's a distribution around it. In fact, that's a, a, a Bernoulli distribution, right? um, binomial distribution. Excuse me, around it. Okay, so uh, what we've just seen is a um, situation where we have, have random connections between agents. Here, there's there's just no regard for locality in any sense of the word. Um, there's no regard for a sort of sub network substructure or anything. We just have these agents that are more or less randomly connected with anyone else in the world. Now, an interesting thing here. Turns out random networks are not terribly representative of the world at all. Um, there, there is a huge amount of locality because of the, the structures of the networks in which we're embedded reflect space. They reflect uh, shared characteristics that mean that if I know two people A and B, those two people are much more than sort of uh, you know uh, average to, to know each other. But the random network is useful as an extreme, sort of an opposite extreme to to um, the local connectivity we see with ring lattice. But moreover, for testing agent-based models, it's very valuable because it can yield results very similar to what's called random mixing in an aggregate model. So within a, a classic system dynamics model, we will often assume that people within a stock, for example, are well mixed. Mm -hmm. And um, in their connections between one another, they sort of are very promiscuous in a way that doesn't have um, uh, privileged sub substructure or anything, you know, distinguished substructure. And so um, the classic case of this is infectious disease models, where um, we kind of assume that you know a given susceptible is equally likely to bump into any infected. We don't require them in any way to be close to them or in the same sort of subunit. <coughs> now there's ways of, of of elaborating those models so that they're stratified, say by age, by sex, and you have what are called mixing matrices. But even there, you're assuming that kind of within a category, people are randomly mixed. They're, they're, they're mixed within that category. Now, it turns out that random networks give us a way of simulating those systems. So if we impose a random network within an agent-based model, it often yields results very similar to what we get in an agent-based model. So you know, often what we do in my group is, for example, we'll have a system dynamics version of a model. We'll build up an agent-based model with the idea of having really rich network substructure and so on, but to test it, to test if we've kind of reproduced the salient features of the system dynamics model first, we compare it against the system dynamics models with a random network. What is the E? Uh, uh, differential equation. So um, for those who are, who are not familiar with it, uh, stock and flow models have a direct mapping to ordinary differential equations underneath the surface. And so here, what we have is, we have shown in black the result of a system dynamics model, and in red the results of many realizations, many sort of runs with different random number seeds of uh, a corresponding agent based model. Yeah? Is there a direct mapping between SD and agent based? Like, methodology? So let's say you have a certain SD model yeah. and you want to replicate it. Could, could you sort of more or less mechanically? translate it into a corresponding yeah. agent-based model? The answer is yes. Um, I'm not aware of any tool that does this. Um, but I'm aware of one tool, which looks up here, which <laughs> could be used to do it. And it'll be an interesting exercise, actually turn it into a, to a mechanical tool. Um, um, <laughs> you know, uh, you know I, I enjoy tooling, but um, you know, you want a mechanical tool. What's that? I'm not talking so much. 
Yes, there is. So, 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 um, so you you could you could logically formulate a model that's sort of the the, the obvious equivalent. Now, when I say obvious, I'm using a uh, I'm, I'm using, putting in some wiggle room here because the issue is um, you'll notice that one of the things you see here are stochastics, right? Mm -hmm. And um, those reflect, for example, the assumption that um, that uh, well, it's it's more or less uh, imposed actually. Now that I think about it, when we have a uh, stock and flow, so we have we have our um, you know uh, effective stock and maybe our recovered stock, right? And you have some flow in a system dynamics model between them right. with uh, an average uh, time of toss, say. So if we, this would be I over tau, this is uh, for first order delay. This is kind of what we have the, the, the number of people coming out in any given month. Um, if their average time in here is I due to little slon, so on, we, we get the number, the rate of which they come out, number per month, as being I over tau. Okay? Um, if tau is long, if they're in here for a longer and longer time, for a fixed number of people here, there are going to be fewer coming out for time yet, right? So if, if we have, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a thousand people um, and we have uh, an average time to recover from an illness of one day, that's going to be a lot coming out early, right? On the other hand, if, if it takes them a thousand days to recover from the illness, we're going to have few coming out per day. So the, the rate of flow is dependent on that. And this is... This is uh, reflective of a sort of a Poisson, uh, Poisson arrival, where this is uh, the, the, the time in here, the, the uh, duration time, the residence time of that stock is exponentially distributed for a given person. You're more likely to be in there, you know, smaller number of times than a more one. That's kind of obvious. Um, and this is a Poisson arrival. The assumption is your chance of leaving here in any given time unit is one over time. Okay, so if you're in here, no matter how long you've been there, you have a certain chance, just roll those dice, that you're going to leave in the next time unit, right? And that chance, that likely density, that chance per time unit is, is one over tau. And you map that to a, when you map to a, uh, to a state chart, which conceptually seems kind of similar, I and R, this is, is what we call the rate, right? Um, we set it to a rate, and that's a Poisson arrival. It's, it's assuming that it's memoryless, that you have a certain chance per time unit of going. But the difference between this is this is this is deterministic, right? You actually get sort of if you look at the number of people here over time, you get it goes kind of like that. Um, this is the number number of infectives. Um, in the state. It goes down exponentially. Meanwhile, up here, the number of infectives will not, it's, it's stochastic. You get, you get departures. And it starts maturing when you start having very few of these, right? Because right. you're never going to have fewer than one other than zero here. Well, and you're going to either have zero or one. And if it makes a big difference between zero and one, like if disproportionately the fact that there's no infective out there with Ebola in Boston is, is a significant fact for public health authorities compared to, you know, there being uh, one. And uh, in a system dynamics model, what you're going to be getting, in compartment model, you're going to be getting a, an exponential dry up, so you might have 0.1 out there, right, or 0.05. So you're going to actually have stochastics in the model that result from this. Um, uh, from this effect, and actually at very small numbers, once you start getting down to very small numbers of individuals, you actually can see some systematic divergence between the two. Okay, because because the quantization matters. Um, but zero is nobody gets infected whatsoever. But if you were to draw the same chart, uh, I over time mm -hmm. uh, in the state chart model, then mm -hmm. what would you see the discrete? So you would, you would, yeah, exactly. You would see something like, imagine I is not so big, like 10 or something, right? Mm -hmm. You would see something like, um, you know, it might jump down big mm -hmm. and then kind of uh, go. And then, uh, generally speaking, it's going to sort of get, mm -hmm. gets, 
smaller over time, and then it's going to go, and then then it's nothing, mm -hmm. right? Um, something something along those lines. I might be, you know, uh, downplaying sort of the, the, the more gradual slope. Something along those lines, and then then nothing whatsoever, right? And if you impose the act, of, you know, the the SD one, the the uh, deterministic model on top of this, the stock and flow model, it might look something like like this, mm -hmm. right? Um, and my point is that sometimes this tail matters a great deal, right? Um, because uh, one person is a, even a, you know, the presence of some continued individual is a disproportionate effect. And this might be given the mean of this, but that doesn't mean the model applied to the mean is not necessarily the mean of the model applied to various cases. Um, it seems like either yeah. as your population becomes infinite, yeah. it'll approach that, or as the number of replications becomes infinite, the average will um, be certainly, certainly as the, as the population size, as the number of replications, not necessarily, it turns out. Um, as D is as D is encoding, or is it? Sorry, because if you had a if you had a very small population, um, uh, let, let's take the extreme case, right? Let's imagine you start with a population of uh, of, of one, right? I, I I would actually venture that that even with a lot of replications, you would get divergence between the results for that versus uh, between the two models, mm -hmm. uh, be, because. Uh, because of the underlying sort of uh, nonlinearity associated with the impacts of one individual. Okay. Um, but well, yeah. What I say is that uh, it's not asymptotic, it eventually goes to zero, right? Sort of at some point in time, right? So the SD chart. The, no, so, so here, other than round off issues, mm -hmm. it, it goes on arbitrarily long. It just is arbitrarily small. It gets smaller and smaller so and smaller. It's, it's, it's e to the mm -hmm. e to the minus. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Tau over, uh, over so so mathematically, it's uh, yeah. some total of so so it will never reach the zero. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it will never reach it. And and it 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 can't because there's a if there's a fundamental nonlinearity in the model. I mean, actually, Chris's question. I mean, for certain models which exhibit only linear effects, they'll actually come out to be the same thing. But in a model like a, a infection transmission or a, or a behavioral transmission model, you know, sort of an attitudinal transmission, um, they're nonlinear effects, um, and and you can get um, you can get very different uh, behavior. So, like, if I were to have a population, I don't know if I want to go into this too much, but if I were to if I were to have a, a nonlinear function of x, so let's suppose uh, x squared or something. Um, and I were to take some population of x's, okay, some population of possible values x. x is a random variable. It's not necessarily that's true that e of x squared is equal to the square of, you know, the expectation of x squared is equal to the to uh, mm. this square. In fact, it's not the no. case in general. Um, uh, that those two will, will typically be quite uh, quite different. So so in short, um, uh, you, you can in fact get get real divergence of effect. As a, as the population size goes up, these effects will matter less and less. Um, I've yet to see a sort of good formal discussion of this in the agent-based model literature. I suspect there are some, if for example, in statistical mechanics and physics and so on, where, where I think these these issues are well well understood. Okay. Um, I'd be more than happy, if, if there were class interest in this, I'd be more than happy to sort of give a lecture on those effects. But those are sort of off the cuff. Um, what is true in general is that we can straightforwardly create an equivalent uh, agent-based model up to stochastics, okay? That's equivalent to an SD model. That does not mean that in all cases the means of the two will be equivalent. If, if 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 the SD model has has nonlinearity, so that that's really the. And, and where's the nonlinearity, by the way, in an infection transmission model for for SD? When I mention this term, I don't want it to sound really vague because it's sometimes used in a vague way. Where's the nonlinearity in a in an infection transmission model? Anyone tell me? In SD. 
Sorry? Yeah. NS, NSD, yeah. Uh, okay, so if I have, it, it is associated with a form of feedback. So if I have S to I to R, mm -hmm. I've written one piece of it over there, right? This is, say, I divided by some mean time in this state. But the key thing is actually this term, okay? And specifically, the, the way it's classically formulated, um, forgive me for, for doing injustice here to mathematical epi, because I could give lectures on the subject. But um, suffice it to say that we, what we generally consider, and this holds for infection transmission or for attitudinal transmission or for uh, persuading people to adopt their products, you know, fast, um, fast diffusion model. Generally speaking, we think, okay, um, let's consider a, a given susceptible, okay? Um, they have a certain number of contacts per unit of time. Let's, let's say it's they, they meet on average 10 people per day that they could persuade about a product or that they could, with whom they have sexual contact or whatever, see, see people per day. And of those, the question is, what fraction, so we're considering the susceptible, we're imagining them surrounded in class, and what fraction of the people around them are infective? <laughs> got it. Uh, are infective? The, the assumption is well, it's it's going to be the same as the fraction for the whole population. This is the well. This is the that sort of well mixed assumption, the random mixing assumption I was talking about. We're assuming for that susceptible that the people around them are kind of typical people in the whole population. We're not we're not recognizing that they have a special location in the network. They have a, a certain certain position that may expose them to certain types of people, or maybe that the infection hasn't reached their neighborhood yet. Instead, we're dealing with a whole population. So, imagine they have 10 contacts per day, and we think, okay, well, in the population as a whole, we'll use it as kind of representative for their contacts. Population as a whole, what fraction of this population is infected at a given time? Yeah, exactly. I over S plus I plus R. Right? And, and then we have, okay, so they have 10 contacts per day with anyone. This fraction, <coughs> I over S plus I plus R of those contacts, get rid of that extra slash, that, that extra thing there, uh, S plus I plus R, or that fraction of those contacts are infected. So maybe it's 50% of the whole population. So this means they have 10 times 50% or five contacts per day with infected people. And the assumption here, it's a simplifying mathematical assumption, but it works very well if beta is small, is uh, there's a certain chance per contact of transmission. Let's say it's a, a chance beta, okay? And it turns out that this is, again, it's a bit of an approximation, um, but if they have this many contacts per day with infectives, we, the assumption is if we multiply times beta, it's very close to the probability of getting infected by any, any one of those people, okay, those infectives. Um, so this is what's called the force of infection, uh, force of infection. This whole thing with C times uh, this fraction, I over S plus I plus R, times beta, okay? That's the force of infection. So that's the chance per unit time, right now, a susceptible will get infected, okay? Now, what, that, what does that mean? If this is the chance a given susceptible here will get infected per unit of time, how many susceptibles per time unit are coming out here? Each of these people has that chance per time unit of getting infected. How many people are coming out here? What's the flow, flow rate? Call this the whole thing time jump. What's the flow rate? It's S times lambda, you know, lambda times S, right? It's just this thing, the chance that a given one will get infected times the numbers that are at rest. So this is the classic formulation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there is a nonlinearity here in terms of um, S, I, and R. And most notably, it's a nonlinearity in the fact that if you unpack this whole thing, what you get is C. I'm going to rearrange terms a little bit here. Um, well, I'll, I'll even leave those. Um, but C times I over S plus I plus R times beta, and then you have S times this whole thing. And so here we have basically a nonlinearity S times I. This is a nonlinearity in terms of the state variables. In other words, um, if you were to D 
double the population size of S and I. It more than doubles this flow rate, right? Mm -hmm. Because we get it, it actually goes up, um, it goes up from SI to 54 times the original SI. And so it, it more than, than doubles this thing. So you actually get, this is a, a nonlinearity in terms of state variables, and you, uh, as a result, don't get sort of additive uh, behavior uh, associated with it. And this, this is something that leads to very rich behavior associated with these models. It also means that you can't, you can't symbolically integrate them. I mean, you can't sort of enclose them, solve them symbolically. Um, but the point is, this, this nonlinearity matters in terms of these quantization effects that, that you know, 0.5, having 0.5 individuals is not the same as the average of having one individual and average of having zero. It's a different, it, it yields different, different uh, things, just as much as for, for these things here, it's, it's different, okay? So, so that's what I mean when I say there's a hidden nonlinearity in that model. If this were just a model of diabetes and, and that people are totally independent and how long it takes them to get diabetes and recover from it, actually there'd be, the, the, there'd be no nonlinearity and the two would give uh, equal sort of means, okay? So if there's, particularly when there's interactions in your model between people, when different classes of people interact, it's a, it's a sign that often there's that nonlinearity hidden and that can yield to quite different results from that kind of SD model that deals with the average. Okay. Any any questions about that before I, I go on here? But this was actually a validation run that one of my students did with one of her models. And then she took this model and imposed rich network structures on it. But this was kind of to help validate it. Okay. So um right. So this is with uh random connections between people. What we can actually do is um, uh, here, we could ask it, as we've seen, to draw it um, in a random way, a layout type um, user defined or layout type random. We could also ask it, uh, or we could ask it to do ring. Remember we saw that? Remember a ring one with random? What did it look like? What was the ring with, with a random network topology or Poisson random network? What did it look like? It looked like a Yeah, it it, um, it 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 had it had things in the middle. Um, <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, this this is the donut with the spider web. Yeah, that's that's it's it's good. Okay, so here we have the the donut with the spider web here. Um, um, oh yeah, there you go. Okay, yeah, <laughs> okay, very nice, very 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 nice. Um, notice I had a small number of connections per agent, so it. It was a less thick spider web than before. Um, oh, what a tangle web they weave. We're gonna increase it to four, right? Um, okay, so um, this is with random connections. You can also, let's just have a bit of fun here with layout types, um, if I can assume that's what you're having. So let, let's go to arranged instead of ring, okay? Let's just take a look at arranged, okay? And um, let's, uh, let, let's go run that. Um, so this is an arranged one. Another way to kind of view this, now people are arranged in this kind of lattice spatially and we can kind of see who's connected with whom and see something about sort of the heterogeneity and the number of connections and so on. But uh, generally speaking, we're, we're seeing um, another way to kind of have a structured layout, just like we saw with uh, a ring, right? Correct, because right now the model doesn't care about their spatial location. Mm -hmm. Now, if 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 it somehow used their spatial location to dictate things, then it then it would matter potentially. But here it's purely epiphenomenal. It's it's just kind of a, a, a convenience. Um, so uh, the other thing we could do, just just while we're at it, is we could do a spring mass layout. Now that's not going to be terribly meaningful here. We'll see another case where it is meaningful. But basically, this will try to pull together in space people who happen to be connected. So, here's a here's a ring here's a, a spring mass layout. It tries to it's kind of like they're connected via springs, and if they're too far apart, you know, uh, it'll kind of pull at them. 
some people may be pulled from multiple sides, right? Um, and it'll just try to connect, like this one here. He's connected with two over here, but he's connected with that one up there, and so that one. Connected. Now, don't ask me like why this is. No. Uh, it, it probably has to do with vagaries of the algorithm. It doesn't want them all collapsed either, and it may be that these things have a minimum length either. If they go too short or too long, there's uh, there's pressure either way. You know, um, so it may be like a spring, push it. Like a slinky just pulls, but you know, uh, other types of springs, like in the uh, in the pen. Yeah. Push pull polarity magnets. So so you might have you might have pull if it's too wide or too short, right? Um, so. Um, I think I won't. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, we'll leave those for another time. So um, these springs here. Um, these are, are, are pulling at things, and I think maybe it tries to make a, 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 a certain length, but not, 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 you know, it tries to pull it in, it's too wide, tries to push it out, it's too long. But this kind of does group people who are closely connected. And unfortunately here, there's a lot of people, um, people connected uh, pretty tightly there in the center. Um, okay, um, so I'd like you now to choose a scale-free network, okay? So we're kind of cycling through network types. By the way, I, I did say that a Poisson random network is similar to random mixing. What could I do, thinking outside the box here of these particular network types, in what way is it not similar to totally random mixing that sort of anyone can bump into anyone? What, in what way is it there's still kind of structure that limits random mixing in, a, in this Poisson random network that we had? There is something. Okay, yeah, there's still outliers, and, and maybe along the lines of what you're thinking, there is um, uh, there are individuals who have persistent connections with each other, but not with others, okay? So if you really want to make it very, very, very close to random mixing, what you would really want is a random, a sort of a random re regrouping of that network periodically, where it kind of, in other words, your connections um, change. So you don't have persistent links. Like right now, those persistent links are chosen with arbitrary people, but they are um, static. And so it privileges you in some ways if you have lots of connections. But if you had them changing over time, it would be closer to random mixing. So just going back to the force of infection, in other words, yeah. the connection is basically a C. Yeah. But the, the uh, basic equation that we're setting up is yeah. suggesting that the, the contacts are random every single unit of time. So, so this number of, well, okay, to be clear though, um, the, the units um, of measure of C here are connections per unit time. Yeah. So that's the number of connections I have with anyone per unit time. And the assumption is that those are equally with anyone out there, okay? So it's, it's, not, um, uh, it's not necessarily with, with the same people every time. In fact, it's, it's definitely not with the same people. So if you redraw through a network with yeah. connections equal to C at every time, that yeah, would yeah, it, it would it would be uh, very very close. And if you did it twice every time, it would be even closer, etc. But as you saw, it was actually very very close already because it kind of very quickly forgets who mixed with who, you know once it starts spreading out and so on, it forgets where it came from because there's just so much interconnection and so on. Um, it's uh, the effects of those little heterogeneities and persistent structure are pretty small for most, mo well, for that model at least. Okay? Um, just be aware that that is a difference. Um, static networks aren't the be all and end all. Um, dynamic networks sometimes do. Does the, the, does the term locality yeah. have, when you use that term, yeah. does it reference time as well? In uh, sense? Okay, so I, I sometimes use it in a. Um, in a, in a sense of a, a, a static sense. So I, I was actually referring to it as kind of a static sense, having to do with structural locality. But you, you can think of, um, when, it, when it comes to dynamic networks, you, know, you could think of, of temporal locality, like maybe I'll be connected with someone in a short time after this or something like that, right? And in fact, I mean like a fair bit of, bit of our work uh, is, is cluing into the fact that often contact structure between people 
um, certain types of contacts, at least physical contacts, are are a derivative properties of their location. Right. So um, not all contact. I mean, obviously, I could pick up my phone and you know, call my wife, uh, even though we're, we're physically separated. But um, uh, there are there are a lot of contacts in the world where it's people's um, people bumping into each other that allows things to spread. And it may be, uh, you know, we know that uh, people, um, you can spread pathogen to one another, but also in terms of influence, there's studies that suggest that people in close proximity are more influential on one another for, for norms and so on. And, uh, di or at least disproportionately influential, uh, influential compared to if they were at a distance. So, so the point is that, um, uh, you know, network, what we think of as network structure are sometimes useful fictions um, from that standpoint. And, uh, and often what's going on is that there's some movement patterns that give rise to that network structure. You know? And, and uh, we may see some of that uh, or talk about it later in, later in class, but it's a general principle. Okay? Um, so static networks, you should be asking, don't think just because you have a static network that that you've examined everything. I mean, there's the whole di network dynamics, which can be pretty interesting, actually. Um, okay, so um, what I suggested is that we go now to um, a scale-free network. Um, and um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to actually have a uh, have this in a ring pattern, okay? And I'm going to do it with the tiny population over here, okay? Um, just so we can we, we can see a little bit more clearly something about the um, oh <laughs> that is scale free but in kind of a trivial sense let me let me I didn't attend to the parameter here okay m is is ten okay that's uh, that is interesting that it didn't um, um, let me let me just uh, bump that up sorry no it's actually uh, it should be uh, okay. That's uh, that's a, a, a curious thing. Let me just try it with this larger. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Well, um, that meant. I mean, that because you have fewer than that many nodes. Okay, yeah, I think it has something to do with that. I I agree with you. Um, so, so it does it does with one. Okay, so let's let's uh, switch to one. That's interesting. I've never. Never in country. I think you're exactly right, though, that it has a limited no range of variability. Scale-free networks exhibit tremendous variability in terms of the level of connections. There's some people, there's a lot of people with very few connections and some people with lots. So this is an example of a scale-free network there with M being 2. The mean number of connections is approximately twice M. But what you'll see here is that there's a lot of people who have a, a modest number of connections. And then there's there's certain hubs. There's certain hubs that have lots and lots of connections here. And what we will see is that there's a um, um, there's a uh, importance for looking at this on the one hand, and there's a um, uh, there's significant uh, implications of it, and there's a mathematics <laughs> behind it. I'm looking here at the time and. I have a number of slides on, on scale-free networks because they're a particularly interesting characteristic. Maybe what I will do um, with your uh, leave is um, just, just I, I will pause for, the, for a break before doing scale-free networks, but I want to talk about one other network type while well, two concepts are in your mind, okay? So we've looked at two types of networks already that are relevant for another type called small world. We'll come back to scale-free in a minute. But small world was a network that actually was defined. The network type of small world was defined to capture, in fact, real world patterns. And it was, it was specifically defined to try to capture the fact that we simultaneously have a lot of locality in our connections on the one hand, and at the same time, we have a few global connections. We often have some connections that are more global, but a lot that are local. And so a small world network represents a weighted combination of two types of networks that we've seen, okay? The two types being a ring lattice network on the one hand and a random network on the other. 
Now, these are, I argued, themselves kind of to extremes. Ring lattice has purely local connections. This is this 1D type of connectivity. Random network has mostly global connections, okay, and Poisson random. Or let's put it this way. It has a huge number of global connections because it doesn't care when it connects some when it connects two people, it doesn't care anything about whether they're closely connected in any other way, just a certain chance. So with a small world network, we're going to have this weighted combination between them, okay? Um, and there's going to be a parameter called in any logic the neighbor link fraction that dictates what fractions of connections are to purely local neighbors and what fractions are global. And what it's going to do is it's conceptually going to start with a ring lattice network. And then it's going to rewire it. Okay. It's going to it's going to take a certain fraction of those connections, the neighbor link fraction, and it's going to rejig them so that they're with arbitrary people in the network, somewhere else in the network. And what's going to come out of this is a network that has some features of ring lattice. So that goes from zero to one fraction. Yeah. And if I say it's zero, then I think goes to ring lattice. Yeah. Yeah. Precisely. Ring. Precisely. Um, and uh, be aware, though, that connections per agent for small world networks is off by a factor, at least it was in the previous version of many logic, mm -hmm. by a factor of two for what it is with the, um, uh, what it was for the um, random network. So, so let's, just, let's just go take a look at this, and then we'll break uh, here, and we'll resume for scale-free networks, which have a merit to a deeper discussion. Okay, so um, we go to the, the environment again, and we're going to go to a to a small world network here, and we have connections per agent again, and a neighborhood link fraction. So neighborhood link fraction. First of all, let's just start with one. So what should this look like? With a, if that should be one, what do you think it would look like? That's going to be the ring. That's going to be the ring. So. Um, here we should have something. Um, now, why is that a ring, ladies and gentlemen? It is, it is a ring. It's a ring where each person is connected with with two individuals on each side of them, or four total, right? Um, and so, you know, it might have fooled you because you saw some sort of chordal connections going through it, but it but it is in fact a ring lattice network. Now let's go see as we bump up that. Um, that, uh, excuse me, bump down that neighbor link fraction. Let's bump it down to 0 0.9, right? Um, I'm doing this with a tiny population where there's only 10 people in the first place. Um, and, and we'll do this. And OK, now we have something like that. Um, notice, interestingly, that we had some that are now isolated. But then there's some others that are connected more globally, like this guy here specifically <laughs> is connected with with this one here way across the network. Um, this one is connected, oh, excuse me, that was one it, it could have been connected with before. Um, but it's basically rewired some connections to go between random people. Hmm. Yes, that's, that's, that's right. So the idea is that within our worlds um, that we circulate, well, we have a lot of connections with people that are close to us in other senses, physically close to us, connected to us through mutual friends, uh, other you know, relationships and families, et cetera. Um, often we have some global connections. And those global connections, it turns out, really, really matter when it comes to infection spread. So let's sort of riffing off this question, Let's go see where they matter. OK, so what I'm going to do is now keeping those same parameters. By the way, here I'm, I've specified those parameters in the model. So any of these simulations I'm running will use those parameters, right? So let's run the parameter with, with this population. Um, here what we have is a situation where the network uh, spread is a lot faster than with the, remember what we saw with the ring lattice for the same size? Um, so even though we have only 5% of connections being global, look at them. The web is in the middle is thin. But we have the infection spreading very, very quickly. Because, because of those global connections, we can actually reasonably quickly get, get to anyone else in this population 
reasonably quickly. So this is what you're saying is that it's more of an intermediary between yes. a purely ring and a purely random. Correct. But intermediary in structure mm -hmm. and in definition, not intermediary necessarily in behavior. Right. Because those just a few of those connections polluting it, contaminating it, or what have you, um, can lead to a really big increase in the speed of infection transmission and the, and the influence that a person can have you know, over time. It, it really can accelerate it, okay? So the, the global connections, just a few can make a disproportionate difference. And in fact, you know, if, if we were to take this, we couldn't do it with the 10 person so readily, but if we were to take this and make it 99% are connected with neighbors, something along those lines, and we had only one, We'd still have a um, we'd still have a shortcut, you know, and um, just that one shortcut. It's not going to be invoked immediately, but watch this, you know. Once we get once we get there, okay, now it starts mm -hmm. spreading there. So so those nodes have a, a big difference. And so the term was coined six degrees of separation to reflect the fact that um, you know, given that we do have some global connections, most of us are. Know mostly local people, we know a few. We can get to pretty much anyone in the world with just six hops if you take advantage of these connections. If you were to kind of route it, um, route a message that I want to get to someone in, you know, Swaziland or something like that. I don't, I don't know anyone in Swaziland. I, I, I don't have a good relationship with someone in South Africa. But, you know, I, gosh, I know a PhD student who's married to someone from South Africa. I could probably get the message through her to him. And, you know, he might not know anyone in Swaziland directly, but he knows someone who used to travel there, and, and he could probably ask him, hey, do you know someone in Swaziland? And pretty quickly you could get it to there. If I want to get a message to, you know, um, uh, you know uh, the Antarctic base station or something, I could probably do it reasonably quickly, right? Um, so six degrees of separation. It, it can be misleading to think that just because 99% of these are local, that the behavior is going to be 99% like a ring lattice node. Far from it. It's going to actually have a lot, um, a lot more behavior that uh, reflects sort of the the structure you see in a uh, a small in a in a random network. Um, just because of a few connections make a huge difference. So this whole phenomenon of being able to communicate quickly across the world, rather than in a very painstaking local way it makes all the difference you know it can make all the difference in terms of influence transmission the speed of news etc ugly news travels fast um, and uh, this, is, this is one of the reasons you know um, so anyway small world networks conceptually structurally they are a mixture behaviorally they exhibit many of the properties of um, of, of um, more densely connected uh, networks. Um, okay, the other thing I want to mention is uh, uh, before we start scale break and, and handle scale free networks, I want to draw the distinction between um, when we started, we talked about distance based networks. That was the first type we looked at, right? And in distance based networks, again, space is, is a primary and connections are secondary. Connections come from space. With scale, with a um, uh, a spring lattice, uh, a spring spring mass network layout. What we have is in fact the reverse. We have a situation where connections are primary. That's the thing that's taken as really um, dictating where people are located. And so we lay them out in a way that visually groups people, and in fact spatially groups people who are well connected. So there you're imposing a network and the location comes out of it rather than imposing a location and the network comes out of it as we did for distance, okay? Um, so those are some uh, combinations there. I'm gonna uh, break now and then we'll go on and uh, talk about scale-free networks and, and then some caveats um, with some of the, uh, the network considerations. Okay, so. <coughs> This. It's, a, it's unfortunately a really busy afternoon, and I didn't get a chance to either. Okay, so um, we're going to be continuing on now within the same lecture, in fact, for a discussion of, of uh, 
uh, scale-free networks. So we've talked about several types of networks um, supported by any logic. Um, we talked about the distance-based networks. We talked about green lattice. We talked about uh, plus on random. And we talked about small world. Um, and we also talked about various types of layouts that can be used with those those networks um, being important for understanding uh, and uh, and in, in some cases important for sort of uh, where people are uh, who, who is connected um, so um, what we're going to be looking at now is, is a particular class of network that's, that's attracted a lot of attention recently um, and it's a very interesting class from an analytic as well as a practical standpoint and, it, and it's called a scale-free network. And we'll talk about why it's called scale-free, how they're realized in any logic, um, and um, give some flavor of sort of where they arise. So um, we've seen heterogeneity in some of the network types we've looked at. So of the network types we've examined today, um, <coughs> what, um, what types of these networks that we've looked at exhibit heterogeneity in terms of the number of connections people have with others? Or, or maybe I'll ask it the reverse. What type of network have we looked at today which doesn't exhibit heterogeneity? The ring lines. Again, I'm not quite sure what any logic does with non-even number things. Maybe it has some random thing. But, but for all the even number ones where you're connected in a very regular way with a certain number symmetrically on each side. It's all uniform characteristics, right? The extreme that I referred to. Um, all the others, Poisson random, distance space, small world, they all exhibit some measure of heterogeneity. But relatively speaking, that degree of heterogeneity was <coughs> fairly modest. Um, Nonetheless, a heterogeneity in, in network structure is something that's attracted a lot of attention. Um, and even that measure of heterogeneity can be important. For example, um, at a, a prosaic level, the difference between having zero and one connections right, could be important. As we know, um, uh, in connecting components, right, if, if the infection started in one component, it matters a lot if by chance someone's connected and your component is connected with that component or not. Because if they're not, it might not be able to bridge over to your, to your component. Um, so heterogeneity, you know, the chance of connections and so on, it, it can have some difference. Um, here, with the infection spread uh, context, and indeed with idea spread, um, it, it acquires a, a special degree of, of uh, significance because someone with a high number of partners, a high number of connections, is simultaneously more likely to be infected by, or this could be you know, uh, secure you know, important news from, say, a partner. Right? So they're simultaneously more likely to be infected by someone with an idea, with a, with a pathogen, <coughs> and more likely to pass it on to another person. They have a bigger catchment basin, so to speak and a bigger number of people that they directly influence. And for both those reasons, when it comes to infectious diseases, and indeed when it comes to influence, these people with a high number of connections are, are really, really interesting and important characters for, for many applications. Um, so if, if you have a limited number of interventions um, uh, that you can uh, roll out, say in a public health context, um, the individuals who have a large number of connections may really be a group you want to focus on because they have this disproportionately being at risk and disproportionately imposing that risk on other people. And often we see very different infection rates in high contact individuals. Um, so uh, it was observed, I should give a little bit more context, it was observed that, um, that there were some Contexts where, when you modeled a uh, situation in a classic way, assuming well mixed population, some mean number of connections per person, this kind of glosses over, you know, sort of who has more, who has less, some mean number across the population. What you 
modeled some things this way for certain diseases out there, certain infections that, that spread uh, through the population accompanying their diseases. Um, the infection should have died out. It shouldn't have stuck around. It should have been beyond that tipping point where it would disappear without public health intervention. But it was still persistent. And even with a lot of effort, sometimes these infections, say gonorrhea in some cities, um, would, would stick around. You couldn't drive it easily out of existence. And it was noted that, well, the fraction of people in the population that had gonorrhea might be very, very small. Those people were often what some of my STI contact partners, um, people in STI clinics I work with, call frequent flyers. The people who, who get it a lot. So there's a lot of people who don't get it all, and some people get it a lot. And there's a question about, well, why isn't this thing dying out? With a lot of childhood infections, there was huge success in driving them to near extinction. So you look at chickenpox, you look at measles, you look at mumps. And for many, many years, with vac because of vaccination efforts in large part, we were able to secure what's called herd immunity. Even though individuals in the population might still be susceptible, the population as a whole was resistant to it because there was too little, too few people out there who were susceptible for it to really catch fire. So that each person who got it by chance, maybe bring it back from another country or whatever, would only typically transmit it to less than one person before they recovered. It would kind of peter out would die out. Maybe they'd infect two people if they're really unlucky, but each of those would be surrounded by enough people who were resistant to it that on average they wouldn't infect enough for it to take hold. And the thought was that it should be that way for some other conditions, but it wasn't. Those conditions were persistent. They were living, but they were living in certain subgroups within the population. Certain subgroups that had distinctive characteristics in terms of, say, contact patterns. And, you know, people were interested in, could we have a, a disproportionate effect by focusing on those individuals, focusing our effort on those frequent flyers, rather than, you know, anti-gonorrhea efforts on your average, uh, your average t you know, typical, you know, randomly selected person within the population. So um, looking at this, what people found was that, and I'll skip forward uh, perhaps a few slides here, was that if you look at the number of the characteristics of individuals, um, one of the things that struck researchers about these cases was that often the infection was circulating in individuals who were a very small fraction of the population this being sort of the fraction of the population associated with groups with a certain number of partners, sexual partners in a one year period. There, there were some people with very large numbers of uh, very large number of partners, very small numbers of those people, but that's where the infection would be living. And then there's lots of people who are very few partners, say one partner a year, but who would occasionally get infected by those who were with, with lots and lots. And so, you know, these individuals out here seem to have a disproportionate impact, an impact that went well beyond in terms of sustaining the infection, in terms of, of the amount of, of, of human suffering involved, went well beyond what their fraction of the population would indicate. And people noticed that these were really pronounced heterogeneity. So, such that, you know, sometimes you'd have people with tens, even hundreds of sexual partners a year. And very, very, very small sort of standardized frequencies, but, but really those are the people being seen. Why was it these groups? And, it's, and this occurs um, in, in different contexts so with respect to different... Frequency in the population. Yeah, frequency in the population, yeah. Um, so people in sort of investigating networks that would capture some of these characteristics, some of the salient features of these situations. And one of them was just the pronounced heterogeneity. Another issue was the fact that you have this 
so-called log-log behavior, where if you, if you plot things out on a log-log plot, where this is the number of sexual partners per year, this is the relative frequency, sort of standardized frequency, um, you can actually reproduce some of these empirical patterns that, that suggest a, a straight line when you look at it in a log-log plot. So what sort of network would, would um, help understand these sort of patterns? Some people with tons and tons of connections, but most people with very, very few. We're not going to get that, despite the variation we see in a random Poisson random network, we're not going to get that sort of pattern from a Poisson random network. There's variability, but most people center somewhere around the mean. A few more, a few less, but tightly around. We're not going to get it in a small world network. Sorry, so you're talking about Poisson Yeah, Poisson random. Um, when we ran Poisson Random Network, um, so that's where people have closer to the mean. They have, yeah, something around the mean. There is variability. I, I began this lecture by asking which of the networks had no variability. It was really only the, the, the ring lattice. Right. But when we had um, a Poisson Random Network and we had, say, an average of four connections per person, well, I'll do it with a tiny population here, what we saw was. Um, you know, some people had somewhat more, some people had somewhat less, um, somewhat fewer connections. But uh, generally speaking, they were all sort of variations around the same theme. Pretty close. I mean, and again, I argued that it was probably something very similar to a, uh, a binomial distribution. You know, um, and you know, as the number of people in the network uh, rises, uh, you know, to whom they can be connected, and P goes down. You may get, you may get fairly, fairly tight, um, tight behavior. You're not going to get this sort of behavior. Nothing close to it. You're not going to get the sort of huge variability you see here. So uh, researchers identified a class of networks known as, as scale-free networks because they exhibit, in some sense, scale invariant behavior. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So here we denote number of connections of a node by k and here the number the chance of a person having k partners in population or equally the fraction of the population that has k partners is proportional to k to the minus gamma okay. um, or again k is the number of connections that they they have and gamma is some constant and what people found is that a surprising amount of phenomena involving human contact patterns and indeed involving other things like the duration of human's contact um, exhibit power law behavior, at least over for a wide variety of ranges. And for human sexual networks, for example, it's been observed that gamma is between 2 and 3.5. Now we'll talk at an intuitive level about what that means. What do those numbers of gamma mean? Um, but Here's an example. So if gamma is equal to 2, the likelihood of having two partners is proportional to 1 quarter. Of having three partners is proportional to 1 9, etc. It goes down as, as k rises, to be sure. But it doesn't go down hugely quickly. right? Um, it doesn't drop exponentially as k rises. This isn't, <coughs> notice this is not, and I will distinguish this very strongly, this is not gamma to the k or something like that, or gamma to the minus k, which would be dropping, you know, exponentially, um, you know, as, as, as k rises. Instead, this is dropping as k to the minus gamma, which is, is dropping, but it's not terribly fast. And, and it has what's sometimes known as a fat tail a heavy tail. There, there are people way out there, and they're small in number, but they're not infinitesimal, and they're not ignorable. Okay? Um, so it turns out that this frequency distribution that you see, this k to the minus gamma, is what's called a power law. That's what physicists call this sort of situation where you have this gamma power associated with the k's. Gamma to the, oh, uh, sorry, k to the to the power minus gamma. And um, you can view at several different levels the fact that this is um, 
scale invariant. If you kind of zoom in by a certain level, you'll find the, the, same, uh, the same pattern, okay? Um, now, I'll give an example by this. Um, so, the impact of scaling is always identical within this sort of situation. So imagine gamma is equal to 2. Right? Um, and it says x. I should really say k there to be consistent. I, I apologize. I, I, I must have uh, put together these slides at, at different times. This should really be, uh, be k. Um, OK. Um, so if we have some number of uh, k, and we have p of k being the, the probability of a person being having that many connections or the fraction in the population. If we double k, it always divides fractions that have that, that many connections by 4, no matter what k is. So suppose you're dealing with someone who has you know, one connection, and now you're considering the number that have two connections. Well, if, if gamma is equal to 2, we double k, you know, one quarter of the people, that the fraction of the population that has two connections would be one quarter of the fraction that has one connection. But the same thing is true for going from 100 to 200 connections. A huge difference, much bigger than between 1 and 2 in, in absolute terms. But it's still only off by that same factor, factor of 4. Factor of 4 being dictated by doubling to the minus one of gamma. So no matter how many connections we have, the fraction of people with this many connections is is just uh, four times the, the fraction. Twice the um, um, okay, so um, if if gamma equals three, double k always divides uk by eight. Okay. So again in human sexual networks we get this variation perhaps around three to two to three range. And we get this, this behavior. And what that means is there's some room out there in this heavy tail for people with lots and lots of connections. Now, if we plot this on a log log plot, what we'll find is that it comes out to a straight line. And this reflects the fact that we have, again, this is x. So I'm going to have to update this to be k, but bear with this. So the fraction that have uh, x connections is proportional to c to the C times x to the, or the fraction that have it is proportional to the, hence the constant C, x to the minus gamma. And so if you take the log on both sides, right, log of left, log of right, you get log of that equals C minus this, this uh, minus gamma times log of, of x or k. Um, and so if you choose as your axes you, on a log log plot, this is your vertical axis and this is your horizontal axis, you get a straight line. You get an equation with a straight line. Hence the, the straight line will log log plot that we saw. The heavy tail that exists, that even if you go out you know, from 100 to 200, you still are only dividing it by 4, say, if, if gamma is 2. Um, and um, another way to view it is if you kind of zoom in by a factor of, of of gamma or zoom out by a factor of gamma. It kind of looks the same. The, the, a scale, um, if, you, if you, you know, increase your view in terms of number of connections, you still get the same sort of decrease. Now, um, these long tails matter because those individuals out there, again, are at high risk and have a bigger disproportionate impact if they are infected. They're, they're more likely to get the ideas and to spread them around or what have you. Um, so um, in terms of influence, we have huge variability. Um, and you know, people have observed these sort of things with different gammas for different subgroups, for example, um, in terms of behavior, but still fundamentally scale-free behavior. Uh, we've observed it in our own data, incidentally, on, on durations of people's uh, contact patterns, uh, interestingly. Um, and it pops up in lots of places. Another place, for example, is in looking at um, uh, internet connectivity. So um, it turns out that um, with the internet, um, there's a lot of sites that are just pointed to by just a very few sites. And then there's 
some sites that have a massive number of things pointed to them. Google, for example, um, being sort of an obvious, um, obvious case. Now, these sort of networks, we've been looking at statistically, but it turns out that you can look at them generatively as well. How do they come about? How do you build up a network like this? And in fact, the algorithm that was advanced by uh, Barabasi and Albert in Science, I believe, Science Magazine some years ago now, um, uh, described an algorithm for building this up. And it's a very, very simple algorithm. And it reflects the fact of how these sort of heterogeneities develop as well, say, in an internet context. And uh, the basic idea is, imagine that we're, we start with, with some nodes, and we seed a few nodes with a small number of connections. And then we have a chance, we're going to start adding in connections to nodes. Okay? And we're going to add those connections with much higher probability, perhaps even proportional to the number of connections those nodes already have. So, you know, John Sturman's textbook in Business Dynamics refers to this as, as uh, the golden rule in a, in a somewhat perverse sense. To those with the gold, the, the ones who have the gold make the rules. <laughs> you know, to those with the gold now goes the gold. Um, and so you think about something like, uh, like a, a Google context um, or a, a site that's being built up. I mean, if, if you have just a few people that put links to your site, then you know, your site might turn up in, in some Google searches, but it'll be way down there, right? But if you start having more links to your site, it'll bump up. And if people start visiting it more and more and more, it'll bump further up. And then people will be more likely to find it, discover it in the first place, and put links to it, more likely to, to see it when they do search. And eventually, it will become a very, very prominent site. So the greater the initial visibility, it's kind of a, a uh, divergence criteria. That initial little bit of extra visibility may lead to it getting noticed by new people, which leads to even greater visibility. You get this positive feedback effect, where you get some individuals or some sites getting you know, divergently larger in terms of their impact, in terms of their, their, uh, uh, the, the number of connections they have, their prominence, et cetera. So it tends to favor structurally those that are already um, well, um, uh, you know, well pointed to or well, well referenced, well understood, well prominent. And meanwhile, others get ignored. Yes, exactly. Yes, so this is exactly some of the factors that end up getting modeled under the rubric of, of network effects in related topics in, in say, uh, business context or system dynamics modeling, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a very, very real phenomenon. Um, the, uh, the people who, you know, get, get the research grants, um, can get the papers out and get more prominent, and then they can attract the graduate students, and they can, you know, uh, have the credibility to get additional research grants, et cetera. And there's positive feedbacks uh, associated with that that lead to this kind of structural effects we see in these networks. Um, similarly, as the internet built up, you know, certain sites, if you were to replay it, it might be different sites, but certain sites, you know, built up um, disproportionate impact. So Yahoo early on, for example. You could imagine an alternate world internet where you know Yahoo was not dominant, instead Alta Vista, you know, uh, became much larger, or what have you. So stochastics early on, and sort of where things were allocated, can make a disproportionate difference. But the point is, it's a process where those who already have connections are more likely to get more connections, compared to the situation with Poisson random networks, where each new connection added is just added with equal likelihood between any pair of individuals, regardless of location, their existing locality, 
and regardless, indeed, of, of the number of connections they already have. So here, something quite different from the tidy world of ring lattice networks, from even the modest heterogeneity in, in um, you see in small world or Poisson random networks, you get massive amounts of heterogeneity. Those ones who have the gold get lots and lots of gold, and a lot of people get very, very little. Okay? Um, unfortunately, inequities and disparities you also see in the health side and, and, and income side. So let's go look um, in, the, in the model here, and let's use a, a scale-free network. Okay? So um, we actually saw this earlier, um, so it'll be a, a little bit of a, of a redux here, but let's go up to the environment. Um, click on the environment here, and we're going to pull down to a scale-free network. And um, the M parameter took us some time to, to try to figure out what this is, because they refer to M being from a Barabasi Albert paper, but we, we're familiar with that paper, and we didn't see an obvious analog. We thought initially it was gamma. It's not actually gamma. Um, so uh, it is something to do, we believe, with the, the initial seeded number of individuals. And the mean number of connections that results is approximately twice that. Okay? Um, it may be 0.95, or 1.95 times it or something along those lines. In any case, if we have, if we have the M, we saw um, for a tiny population some of the things it would lead to. I'm going to do it for a, um, a, a bigger population. And what you'll see here, okay, now I have this thing clouding the way. Let me get this. I was just illustrating uh, the building of this. Um, maybe I'll get rid of this. Boom. Okay. Um, so let's run this again. So this is with an M of 2. So roughly speaking, I think people here should have an average number of connections of around 2. And you'll see that some people have a bunch of connections. There's like this, this person here, it seems to, this person here. Um, most people have a, uh, a modest number. Um, perhaps we'll do it in a different layout. We'll do it in a range layout, see if that um, uh, gives us any clearer view, because those are awfully, um, awfully crowded. And if necessary, we'll reduce the, the population size. But let's go check this out. So um, here we go. OK, so this affords us a somewhat clear view of the heterogeneity. Um, I'm going to incidentally drag this. If I right click and drag, I think on, on a Mac um, it would be command click. Um, uh, uh, you, you can actually sort of position it better. And uh, what you'll see here is again, some people, a lot of people with few connections, two, 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 um, some with three. And, and then some, like this way, one up there, one up at the top there. Um, this one here looks, looks to have an awful lot with a really disproportionate number of connections. Um, a much, much larger, larger number. So here, connections are not spread around evenly. They are, in fact, concentrated in certain individuals. Now, um, I give a, a separate system dynamics version of, of uh, a course in health and uh, health modeling. And one of the things I look at is mathematically why this matters. And it turns out scale-free networks radically change the, the um, propagation of infection in the population because of this effect that those individuals up there, they collect the infection and they disseminate it very, very quickly. And that variability is not a small matter that can be brushed under the rug. It's central to how quickly the infection spreads. So let's, let's just take a look at this. We've timed it roughly. I mean, we have a sense of how it spreads before. But you'll notice what happens is that those individuals with large numbers of connections tend to get infected quickly. So if you, if you kind of switch back to this, and I'll try to drag this down, um, they're the ones who get infected quickly because there's a lot of people that can infect them. And it tends to spread, indeed, over the network very, very quickly compared to, um, compared to the situation with Poisson Random and compared to the situation with, uh, uh, with small world even. Um, yeah. 
That's a great idea. Let's do that. Yeah, that's <laughs> the income. Yeah. Okay, so let's do this. I, I like that idea. Let's go do it. Um, that's a wonderful idea. So double click on person. How would we do that? What would we do? So where would we go to set the size of the node? We saw that before. Yeah, the oval. Okay, and we go to the dynamic properties there, right? And, whoop, hey, come on. Um, dynamic properties. And we're going to be focusing on radius. And, and how, do we, how do we get the number of connections? Does anyone remember? This dot get connection. You've learned well. Um, okay, uh, okay, get connections number, um, right? And we're going to have to do it separately for, um, for uh, radius y. It's actually going to be calling it twice. But. Um, oh, does it? Okay, okay, we'll, we'll try that. Well, you're uh, exhibiting considerable skill in Java. Um, uh, okay, so um, ah, there we go. It's interesting how they how they tend to be clustered up there, but uh, you know we've we've got um, well, okay. So there is a reason. They're clustered up there. I believe the any logic algorithm tends to lead to the first few people in the population being disproportionately favored. And I don't, I don't know why that is. In other words, it's not random. If we did a random layout of this, you wouldn't obviously see it. But here it's laying them out as a person by person. So that's person zero, person one, person two, patient zero. Is the next right? And. Uh, So that's a good question. Um, I will, so I have a, another lecture which um, we'll try to get to where I actually do talk about how you would mechanically sort of go about and, and deleting connections and that sort of thing. And making new, and making new connections, yeah. Um, generally speaking, I think what's happening is that this doesn't go on without, without limits. And, and you know, uh, when you have competition between different different parties, you can get one essentially sort of stealing connections mm -hmm. from another, right? And so it's, it's not a zero-sum game, but neither is it sort of unbounded. Human attention and so on is not mm -hmm. unbounded. And so, you know, you're going to get, um, you're, you're going to get limits to that process. But um, I'll, I'll see if I can address this as your dynamic network. It would be nice to see the dynamic network. Right, right. Um, I, I agree, and it can be done readily. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> It could be done readily. I mean, you could have, uh, you just have to, to do it here, I could add some logic to it, but we'd have to think about like, what would the logic be for a given connection disappearing? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that would take a bit of time. So I'm okay. not gonna do that uh, quite yet. Um, good exercise though. I, I think that's actually an interesting thing to try doing. Um, in any case, uh, what you do see is the result of the scale-free uh, uh, heterogeneity in terms of the size of the nodes and one of them is sort of the, the king king node, right? Um, let's take a look at when king node gets infected. Um, so my guess is if we were to look at the the relative infection times. Oh, okay. So um, yeah. So that that the top node got infected very quickly there. Um, and uh, okay, yeah. Again, you know, within the first, uh, I'd say it's within the first maybe 10% of those that they get infected. Aha, nothing. Scale-free network, but, but no, no uh, catch-on, right, of the infection. Okay, so that's the top node almost immediately. Um, so it tends to be quite soon, quite soon that it gets infected. And uh, had I more time, I'd, I'd show how you could actually record that and compare it to the mean infection time or something along those. Okay. Um, so uh, onwards and upwards. Um, I think uh, I had some um, comments here. Let's let's get this back on um, on um, AVM 
uh, network caveats. Um, so, so from one perspective, you need to be concerned that networks are, and in fact, an emergent phenomenon. Um, a lot of the time, they're driven by something underlying them. And when you think about networks, you have to ask for the scope of your model, for the research question you have, is it important to represent that underlying process? Or do you treat the network as, in some sense, primal? In some sense, kind of the, the um, most uh, basic of, of quantities. You want to think explicitly about that. And you want to think about whether you need to represent dynamics in terms of formation and dissolution of these connections. Um, because those two might significantly change the dynamics of networks. Um, for example, in the, in the health area, people have argued that formation and dissolution of, of uh, partnership bonds is critical for transmitting infection to those who are otherwise, you know, who are constantly monogamous. They have zero or one partners. but if people are making and breaking connections, they might at any time only have one partner, but they might get a partner who had previously gotten the infection and now gives it to them, right? Um, whereas if you view it as static, those are a permanent dyad, a permanent connected pair. There's no chance for either one to acquire it from anyone. You're never going to have a dyad infected. So, you know, relationship formation and breaking is sometimes key for transmitting ideas or infections, um, and it may be worth representing in the model. Um, so most networks are dynamic, but you know, it's hard to get measures that, that yield these these things. We work with a very rich set of data, but it's it's rare, um, and often we have only partial information in network structure um, on a situation, and we have to. Um, we have to recognize that network structure is incomplete, but it, it results from a particular process of gathering it that may not, may not be totally representative. Um, uh, and they are also specific to your definition of contact. What's a contact? You know, uh, is a contact uh, for sexual transmission? Is it is it uh, you know a partnership? Is it uh, a month of partnership? Is it a uh, a single sexual encounter. These things make a big difference in terms of um, how you might represent the network and, and the probabilities that are associated with it. Um, so uh, uh, one example that, that we work with is contact tracing network. So this is a, um, a subset. Uh, this is an 11,000 person contact tracing network. It's a subset of a 44,000 person contact network we have in, in, in our province in Saskatchewan. And here, what you have is, um, is a process that's been built up through public health uh, efforts. And it's not random. This is not a representation of the underlying true societal social network. It's a representation of the network that was gathered by a certain process called contact tracing. Where so what is that special structure? Is that the elite? Or is that um, yeah, so these structures, mm -hmm. they're, they're reflective uh, to some degree of, of geometry. And I think here, excuse me, of, of, of geography. Here I have encoded them by geography, mm -hmm. but you can see that it's not purely geographical. Um, for example, here, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's also some clustering by ethnicity, um, and uh, there is, uh, there's also uh, some out here and so on. Some of these are, are uh, perhaps other um, not so much dictated geographically, by, but just being cases where people, um, there was a kind of little outbreak, but it didn't get very far. And, so yeah. Is that based on real data? Yeah, or this is based on real data. And what software did you use to do that? I used a uh, software called uh, Guess, and, and um, there's, there's two software which I would, there are three pieces of software. If anyone's interested in, in um, network connections like this, I'd recommend three pieces software. Um, two of them particularly highly. Uh, one is Payek. Um, this is a uh, probably the most the most popular social network analysis software. Um, it's uh, and, and actually along with that is, is um, uh, um, uh, UCI Net. Um, UCI Net is another very popular one. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I could do this. Sure. But um, this particular one was actually generated with software called Guess, which is 
I, I really like it because it has a um, Python interface, interactive interface. So this is actually, you could do a lot of this just graphically, but in the Python interface, you could tell it like recolor this, recolor all nodes who have more than two connections and are within this health region. Boom. Um, it's very easy to issue it commands. Even for someone who has very little programming experience, you can, you can learn the basic commands for it and it's amazing what you can do. Uh, very, very powerful and flexible. Um, but it, it suffers from the fact that it's not really well maintained these days. It's free. Oh, what's that? It is free. It is free. Yeah. yeah. Um, Hayek, uh, Guess, and Gephi are free. I think UCI net is, but I'm not, I'm not certain about that. Gephi is a new platform. I have a student who's been uh, contributing to it as part of Google Summer of Code. And this is a fantastic network analysis platform that's being built now. Um, and I, it's going to basically replace Guess. Some of the people who built Guess are now contributing to Gephi. And I know they're working on that sort of um, rich, uh, sort of flexible interface for, for doing commands to, um, uh, in an interactive way. And uh, I don't know if they've rolled it out yet, but it will be out soon, because um, it was worked on a year and a half ago um, by someone in Google Summer of Code. So this, um, Gephi is strongly done. Of all of these, I think um, I would go to that if I had to only pick one for network visualization and manipulation. Um, Gephi is, is fantastic. So um, I'll see if I can post those uh, to the website also. This was drawn in guess, though. Um, and um, uh, so contact tracing networks are, for example, built up by a contact tracing protocol. So the network, you might think of it as primal, but it's not. It's actually built up out of a process that selects certain connections and not others, reports certain things. And, and you know, it's important to think about a, a network as potentially rep as an emergent property of an underlying process on the population. And um, uh, any logic has a bunch of built-in networks that we've seen that are handy for routine tasks but do not offer much flexibility when it comes to certain things. Um, for example, preferential attachment. If you, had, if you had a model where you had people of different characteristics and you wanted people with similar characteristics to be more likely to be connected, that's hard to do with one of the built-in networks. Um, I mean, you can start with a built-in network and then modify, rewire some connections preferentially or something. Um, Constructing built-in networks can be computationally expensive in some cases. Um, for some reason, some of the network, for scale-free networks, it takes a while to compute them for, um, sometimes. And again, the M parameter does not appear to be um, uh, one of the most common parameters. It seems the mean number of connections is approximately twice that n value. It's interesting you commented that it was maybe uh, the minimum, m minimum one. I haven't seen that connection before, but it's possible that falls out of it too. Small world network uses the definition of connections per person. At least this is true in the previous version I was using. Inconsistent with other networks, off by a factor of two. This, yeah. Does this imply that, mm. it sounds like this implies that it's actually very difficult to look up how these things are actually, what the need, what the parameters actually mean in the um, The fact that you couldn't figure out what M is for sure. I, I would say, um, uh, that hasn't been my experience in general, but in this case, what happened is I looked up in the documentation. It gave a definition of it where it referred to that paper. I was happy with that until I went and I looked at the paper. A and, then, and then I found that, that it didn't have an obvious mapping to any one thing in the paper. <laughs> um, and uh, and that, was, that was sort of the one time where I found myself really let down by something um, with their documentation. So, so in general, I, I found it actually pretty decent, but, but that's, that's one vulnerability. <laughs> so, so I must say, I mean, we built up our own scale-free network builder. So if anyone wants it, we can give that to you. Yeah. That's correct. You start what you start with a certain number, yeah, yeah. and then you build up, yeah. and that's what I thought it might have been. But I didn't see, I didn't see any sort of uh, 
uh, any sort of evidence that that's indeed what it is. Maybe it is that, but um, I didn't see any proof. Now, this being said, I haven't contacted any logic and said, you know, tell me exactly what it is. I, we just built our own little one. In uh, yeah, we built it in, in Java. So just to clarify, there is yeah. no uh, chance for any single node in this case of free network to have no connection. That is a good question. Um, um, so I, I, I don't know that mm -hmm. for the fact. Um, I, uh, I could ask a student of mine who's worked with you know thousands of person networks and so on um, whether she's seen that. I do know they're almost always sorted, more or less, mm -hmm. in sort of the way we saw. And the ones at the end have very few connections. And um, I'd have to ask her if I'm she's seen if there is zero or one. I, I would have to go back and review the, the, the paper at issue. Um, uh -huh. uh, it's a paper or sure, sure, the sure. Yeah, it's a famous paper, and I can post it to the website. Um, so poke me on that if I, if I don't do it soon. Um, Okay, um, right. So, um, you know, network dynamics are, uh, networks are often dynamic over a wide range of time scales. So, not only is it the case that people switch connections, but often the duration of contact patterns um, may exhibit great heterogeneity. So, this is actually from data we collected with smartphone based contact detection systems. So, we hand out smartphones to people and they record uh, uh, people's. Uh, locations, contact patterns, uh, how close they are to one another, physical activity levels, can ask them surveys, etc. And one of the things we noted was that the duration and minutes of contacts, um, and this is a log log plot, and it exhibited um, plausibly sort of power law behavior for certain sub-regions. You notice it bends down, but uh, roughly speaking, it's somewhat flat there and somewhat flat here. And um, suffice it to say, what, what this suggests is that there's um, sort of regularities in terms of the degree of time people are together, which again can have a, a, a significant impact on their influence on one another. You know, how long people are together, whether it's a minute or ten minutes, could have a bearing on the outcome of, of that, whether it's disease transmission, you know, infection transmission, or idea transmission. So. Um, just be aware that there's some interesting dynamics underlying sort of uh, switching of connections. Um, uh, right. I should also mention, though, that um, any logic, this is great, um, uh, great thing. Any logic provides a thing called environment.apply network, which, um, which allows you to recalculate a network um, in a way that. Um, for example, can include a new node, or or you know have a node deleted. Um, so uh, we could, for example, um, uh, add a node into a network and then say apply network, and it will wire that person up. Okay, um, I will um, uh, I will show an example of that just before our break here, and then then we'll we'll uh, finish up. Um, so there's some methods for connecting and. To connecting people and deleting connections. And these are the two methods here. So uh, per, per Sergey's question, um, if you have an agent and you have a reference to a call agent A, agent A dot connect to and if agent B, it'll connect to agent B. And you could just say disconnect from. It's as simple as that for connecting people. Um, and um, yes, yeah, yeah. So it, it doesn't matter if it's agent. The, the outcome of it is going to be the same regardless of it's agent A dot connect to agent B or agent B dot connect to agent so A. So remember you mentioned that the line is this polarity and yeah. the plus should be the same order over the Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so it doesn't make any difference when you delete it? Yeah. So, so um, logically, mm -hmm. the network connections are bidirectional. Mm -hmm. In terms of the graphical depictions of them, that's where that, that plus sign came in. That was not about the logical connection, but instead about the geometric representation. So it's a separate issue. Okay. So great, great question. Um, and then there's various methods for dealing with these. With use get connections number, you can ask is agent A connected to agent B. Uh, you can ask give me your nth connected agent where n starts at zero, and you can say hey give me all your connections, give me all the agents to whom you're connected. 
and that gives a, a list you can kind of iterate over in a way that we'll see. So just to just to let you see this, I'm gonna um, uh, this will be sort of a, uh, a sneak peek at something next time. What I'm gonna take um, is uh, this model here, and I'm gonna go to this oval, okay, and under dynamic. I'm going to do something that you haven't seen before, at least here. I'm going to go down to on click. Okay. This is what's called a handler. It's an event handler. But the events we've been talking about so far are kind of events in the model, transitions and message sending and you know an, uh, an explicit event firing and so on. Here, this is a UI event. This is a person doing something with respect to the model's graphical interface particularly clicking a node, okay? So when this says on click, I'm going to do um, uh, this dot get main. What does get main do? That gets the, yeah, a, a, a reference to the object representing the main class, right? An instance of main class. And then I'm going to do add under bar population, okay? Does anyone remember what that does? adds a new person in the population, okay? Um, so what I'm, what I'm saying is, hey, um, when I click this node, do something, and specifically add someone into the population, okay? So um, that's in the on click of the oval associated with the person, right? Okay, so um, now I'm gonna run this with a tiny population, say. Sorry? Oh, oh, thank you. Semicolon, okay. Um, so, um, what's a semicolon? Fine. <laughs> Have your semicolon. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Sometimes it puts it in, sometimes it doesn't. So, if I were, if I were to go, go here, um, um, hey, okay, hey, so where's my person? Well, how many people are there? I'm going to click on this. Clicking in case you can't tell. Um, and look at that, there's 36 people there. Where are those people? Well, it hasn't drawn them, okay? So what do I have to do? Let's go back to that. So you add person, but that's, that's not enough to show it visually. It's enough to do it logically to, uh, to add them to the population, but we actually want to do something more than that. We want to visually show it, and we want to wire them into the network, okay? Okay. So what we want to do is this dot get main again, because we, we're, again, we're going to be working with the environment, the name of the environment dot apply network, okay? So we're telling the environment, hey, go update your network to take into account these new people. No, we could do that if the people are moving around too. Maybe we have a distance-based network and people are moving and we wanted to sort of recalculate the new network based on their movement, okay? You got that? Okay, so now we're gonna run this. Um, and do this and, and uh, here it's, it's doing a network recalculation. Now you notice it's actually completely sort of rejigging the network here. This is a scale-free network. And the more we have, look at those nodes grow. Um, um, the king nodes are, are, are um, bursting before us. Um, so uh, it's a bit of fun to start the weekend. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, but I mean, the implication of this, I mean, this is a bit of eye candy here, but the, the implication is pretty significant here because we've crossed the line from dealing just with built-in events to dealing with user interface interaction. We also have seen, though, that you can quite readily get it to sort of update a network to take into account new information and, in fact, to add new people into a population, right? Um, and you'll notice, incidentally, when I did that, um, that, um, that thing of sort of add, uh, add population, I was actually prompted here, there were actually two add populations. There was another one where I could specify the income and the sex. So I could actually add people in with sort of arbitrary characteristics that I specify. I didn't choose to do that just for speed, I just used the defaults. So these are the defaults for people, okay? Um, 
But that illustrates response to user interfaces. It il illustrates um, the, um, uh, the, the ability to sort of add people to a population and indeed to get it to recalculate a network. If you were to wire them, they just to make it Right. Right. Yeah, well, but let's, let's think about this. So the way in which it generates a scale-free network actually involves a series of steps where it's kind of parceling out these new, mm -hmm. these new links, and it gives more of a chance to those who already have links. And so if you add someone in de novo at the end, it's kind of hard to figure out how many links do they deserve, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's because of that. Let's, let's um, well, yeah. Yeah. Right. That is interesting. That's that's interesting. Um, let's let's go back though to environment because I want to illustrate a principle here. Let's go back to environment and um, on environment. Let us instead do. Instead of a scale-free network, let's do a distance-based network, okay? So we're switching it to a distance-based from a scale-free. We had those, those hubs growing before, but now we're gonna have a different situation, right? So now let's run the same, same model, right? Um, and, hey, huh? Oh, I, I, okay, maybe I, oh, what, oh, what just happened, okay. Um, <laughs> beats me. Oh, uh, okay, this is arranged. Uh, it, it should be uh, user defined. Maybe that had something to do with it. Um, connection range 100, that's fine. Okay. Oh, oh wait, but that was my really small population. Yeah, yeah so, so so no one was connected with anyone else and they were arranged at, at strange places. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, now if I click, what do you think will happen? You think it will totally change it all around? <laughs> uh, 100. That's right. That's right. So, so, so actually here, I'll try to do it with a smaller one because it's actually easier to see what's going on. Part of what's going on visually is in response uh, to that earlier question I had. Um, I had made the size proportional to the number of connections, right? right? So let's let's go click here. Okay, here we're adding people in, and you notice some are kind of added in, in in a. See that? It's kind of. Uh, Correct. We're not we're not analyzing anything about. We could ask this, we could ask information about this and, and somehow use that. But here we're just adding people at random places. What's interesting is though, and I think this related to what was just being asked about now, um, you notice that it's almost like people don't appear unless they're in dyads. Um, like I never see a person totally disconnected appearing here. Yeah, I think the size is exactly zero. So, so exactly. So it's not a mystery. It's not like there's inherently a problem with any logic. It's just that they, they have no width. Now, if we were to change that so that their width were, we're just having fun here. Um, um, yeah, yeah. If we were to change it, okay, no, we got to go down to person, um, and we were to change it so that their width were instead of being just proportional to connection number, it would be one plus it. Yeah. Um, Something, or, or say 10 plus it, right? Um, so to have a, a bare minimum or something like that um, that you guarantee is visible. Then we could run it. Hey, come on. Um, and uh, and now now we have people that, that could be added in. And, and you know, as as they can get added in, in, in isolation, but as, as soon as there's enough people around them, they get connected. And as the network becomes dense enough, they become more um, more likely to, to have someone nearby, right? For so. The, 
Uh, yeah, so, so what you do is you unclick. I'll, 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 I'll uh, I mean, the, the easiest way is to do this. Um, yeah, you message the agent itself. Um, so, so you could do something like this dot, or you, you, sorry, uh, you do send, um, send, send it to this, right? Um, uh, excuse me, is it, is it uh, you send an infection message, right? Um, an infection to this. I think that's how you do it right there. Um, and, uh, and I think that will, will, will do the trick. Um, Could you also do it using the state uh, yeah. part that the transition is based on a zero one of a variable on click to yeah. the variable yeah. to Th That's right. That's right. And in fact, you could send it directly to the state chart. You could actually, you could route a message, I believe, directly to the state chart. But the most obvious way is to just send it to the person. And that's actually somewhat more general because the person probably has a way of handling messages in general. They would know how to handle that, that one. But yeah, that would, uh, that would allow you to sort of uh, infect, you know, disconnected nodes and so on. Right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, enough for now. Um, now, uh, I'm going to try to be posting uh, another problem set um, within the next few days. Also, um